somebody to, to tell you their story, it's, it's something I take really seriously. And it's not something you can just parachute in and ask somebody to open their heart to you. To peel away the layers, to get to the heart of the person who you're telling a story about. France will never give up against the terrorists. And delve beneath the, the surface of what's happening. You can hear their story, and you're going to do their story justice. Thank you. you have to show yourself to Thank them. You. So right now, they're hovering pretty low over this area that, that's uh, extensively flooded. CNN's the right place to tell their story. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. Hang Sing Shanghai, the old-fashioned way. CNN business traveler in China. By the end of the next decade, the largest aviation market in the world. Are you ready for that? Businesses are spreading their wings. China Eastern, keeping the Chinese sky safe. <laughs> New ways to earn miles. Are you still a mile in Yes, always. And bridging culture gaps. Don't ask. On the next CNN Business Traveler. Connect the world with Becky Anderson. It all starts here. Changing, fighting, creating, connecting. That's why we're here. We live here, we work here, we're from here. And we'll go wherever the story takes us. I'm Becky Anderson in Tehran. We are in Jerusalem. Real news that shapes our world. Exploring not just what's going on, but why. I just want to press you on one further point. Getting perspective on this region from this region. Places that many of us know, but few of us get to see. Observing countries on the move, still rooted in tradition. It all starts here, and that's why we're here, bringing you the world from our Middle Eastern hub. Connect the world with Becky Anderson. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. No, it's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first cheque or cashing big cheques. To those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Quest Means Business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. It's high energy and fast paced, so buckle up as Front Seat brings you the latest news and views from the automotive world. Car developments, industry news, interviews with successful drivers, the latest trends and next level innovation here in Switzerland and around the world. On Front Seat, we'll keep you on the right road. Front Seat with Hannah Wise on CNN Money Switzerland. News programs are usually full of short stories that hardly go beneath the surface. We give you the big picture. Every weekday evening at 7 p.m., the big picture goes deeper, looking at an issue from different angles and brings you the guests who make time to speak, explain, and elaborate. Our viewers get a deeper understanding of the day's issues and the context that underlies them. The big picture, weekdays from 7 to 8 p.m. For somebody stock markets fluctuate as the trade war is still a big concern among investors but what about those rising oil prices and why is gold heading higher interesting moves today as the world economy continues to pick up steam also tonight where will the watch industry be in five years from now as Basel World is pushed to reinvent itself, e-commerce and China are redefining the global market and not all Swiss brands are up to the challenge. 
And he single-handedly reshaped Japan's telecoms industry. Our newsmaker tonight, Satyo Sumoto, is a dogged entrepreneur with a proven track record. He puts his success down to being bold and taking risks, but also in knowing that sometimes the best decision you can make in business is to know when to let go. Good evening and welcome to The Swiss Pulse. I'm Hannah Wise and this is The Living Markets. Welcome to the programme. It's Friday the 23rd of March. Let's bring you the main news headlines. Credit Suisse CEO Tijin Tiam took a pay cut in 2017 after shareholder uproar against his proposed remuneration. According to the Swiss Lenders Compensation Report published today, Tiam received 9.7 million Swiss francs. That's 5% less than the year before. Credit Suisse posted a third consecutive loss in 2017, driven by a write-down on tax assets in the United States. TM has asked shareholders, though, to stick with the bank, promising higher capital returns for the coming year. The bank's executive board waived 40% of bonuses to quell criticism from shareholders. Hours after US President Donald Trump ordered tariffs on $50 billion of Chinese imports, China fired back with levies on $3 billion of US imports, including pork, recycled aluminium, fruit and wine. The White House also declared a temporary exemption for the EU and other nations on those levies, making the focus on China clear. Global stock markets dropped Friday amid rising tension and trade war fears. Three people have been killed after a hostage situation in the south of France. It began when a man shot at four national police officers in Carcassonne, injuring one of them. French authorities say the same man then opened fire at a supermarket in the town of Trèbes. The gunman was shot and killed by police. The Paris prosecutor has confirmed to CNN that a murder and attempted murder investigation has been opened in connection with a terrorist incident in Trèbes. The EU has approved guidelines for the negotiation of future relations with the UK after it leaves the bloc next year. The text, which discusses trade and security, among other things, clears the way for the next phase of Brexit talks. British Prime Minister Theresa May said there was a new spirit of cooperation and opportunity. Negotiators say they want a deal on Britain leaving the EU by the end of this year. The U.S. Senate has passed a $1.3 trillion spending bill this Friday that will avoid a government shutdown until September. Among its most significant provisions are pay rises for the military and incentives for states to enter more information into gun background checks. The bill now heads to the White House for the president to sign. Now, President Trump has also announced John Bolton will replace H.R. McMaster as U.S. National Security Advisor. Mr. Bolton is known for his radical approach to foreign policy. In particular, he maintains a hard line when it comes to North Korea and Iran. Bolton served as U.S. ambassador to the U.N. under U.S. President George W. Bush. Zurich Airport has dropped one place in an airport's cleanliness ranking. In at number nine this year, the airport is still in the top ten globally. Geneva International Airport, though, is far behind in 50th place. Asia tops the list, Skytrax, which carries out the reports, puts Singapore Shang Shanghai Airport in the top spot for the sixth year in a row. It's followed by Seoul's Incheon Airport and Tokyo's Haneda Airport. Well, speaking of uh, airports, your travel forecast is up next. There's lots more still to come here in the living markets. Stay with us. CNN Money Switzerland Business Weather, starting with Europe.
next step, Africa and the Middle East. Southeast Asia. And now Australia and Oceania. Let's go to North America. We end our trip with off America. CNN Money Switzerland accompanies you all over the world. Welcome back. You are watching The Living Markets Hour. I'm Hannah Wise. Now, there are a couple of big developments out of the United States which have really impacted markets today. First of all, the looming trade war. Just to remind you, China has retaliated against Trump's tariffs on steel and aluminium by focusing its targets on pork, apples and steel pipes. So the tit for tat on that side continues. But secondly, President Trump has announced that John Bolton will replace H.R. McMaster as US National Security Advisor. Well, let's just take a look what happened. Well, both of these stories had quite an impact uh, on the Asian markets. As you can see, they all plunged this morning uh, on that news and so did European indexes. And you might wonder, is the world in panic? Well, not quite. After dropping by 3% yesterday, the Dow did start in positive territory today. But as you can see, as trading continues this Friday, all indexes are currently in the red. And unfortunately, here too in Switzerland, the SMI followed that global trend, ending the day down nearly a whole percent. So what are the stories behind some of those numbers? Well, of course, when there's any kind of uncertainty, like a trade war, for example, investors usually head to commodities, especially gold. We'll bring you that in just a moment. But first, oil. Oil prices gained after US president installed Middle East hawk John Bolton into that top national security position. You can see here Brent crude up 1.5% and West Texas crude is also up this Friday. So let me bring you that gold figure, as we said. It's interesting to look at that because as investors are obviously fleeing to security amid trade war worries, it's up. It's up a little bit, but up nonetheless, indicating, yes, that there is some uncertainty for investors uh, today. And in the currency world, the dollar declined uh, today, but uh, against the Swiss franc, the dollar stayed pretty firm. And finally, after a week of tech stock turmoil in the Facebook crisis, well, their stock was up this uh, morning on the Nasdaq. But again, following most of the other trends today, it's uh, currently down by 3.373%. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what's happening with Facebook, the data scandal, which is certainly uh, spooked tech investors these days. Earlier, I spoke to Tom Hanna. Now, he's the founder of Web Republic here in Switzerland, one of the leading digital marketing agencies here. And they conceptualize, implement, and optimize advertising campaigns on search engines, display networks, social media, and YouTube. So I began by asking him if he was surprised by what happened with Facebook. I was surprised by the scope of it, clearly. I was surprised that, uh, that actually on, on the large scale that it happened. And you deal in data, similar data, don't you? I mean, how widespread is this kind of practice to buy and sell data? I think, first of all, you need to differentiate between owning data or working with the data that is actually available, right? So uh, as a digital marketeer, of course, you're using platforms like Facebook. You use platforms like Google or other networks um, 
But if you launch a campaign there, you use basically their infrastructure in many ways. But it's a whole different story if you start to scrape data, aggregate the data in such a way, and then um, use it uh, maybe on a third-party device. And platforms. so that, that part would be illegal, but actually looking at data is not. Um, you know, illegal, and I think this is going to be quite interesting to see what is going to happen out of this, uh, because obviously Facebook has asked um, Cambridge Analytica several times to remove the data that they have scraped quite some time ago, which they have not. Um, so this is going to be interesting to see how that will develop. But I think one of the big challenges uh, that we will see or uh, interesting evolutions that we will see is basically how will we deal with uh, the sheer amount of data that we can aggregate also from a legal point of view. Do you think it's just too much of a grey area then when it comes to this buying and selling and scraping of data? Absolutely. I mean, this is still uh, quite a grey area, and we also have to be uh, aware that this is a quite a new discipline that we are in. And uh, we see now that with also the new data protection law, the GDPR, certain initiatives are being taken to kind of like structure and, and identify what can be done, how much, and this is very important, uh, needs to be also uh, opt-in or informed to, by the user. And is this how the user can in, inform themselves and involve themselves in the protection of their own data? So basically educating uh, the education of the user, in my point of view, is something that is extremely important in that context. So how do we protect ourselves? First of all, we cannot be... Uh, we cannot be believe in any app and just click on anything. So we need to have a certain common sense. Also, if I download a free app, for instance, uh, I have to ask myself, um, why is this app free? So what am I giving in return? And most of the time, it's some data point of some kind. But also, if I walk around with my handy, many data points are sent there. So generally, I think it's going to be a very interesting um, evolution to see in the com coming 12 to 24 a month on how the user is actually being educated to um, deal with different devices and become smarter in the way, uh, or better say, more aware on how his data is being shared and used. And this, I guess, this whole scandal could be the starting point of some regulation process. I mean, the regulation process already has started with uh, the GDPR, uh, the data protection mm -hmm. law that's, uh, that is happening. And I think it's, very, it's something very good and, uh, that is happening because what we have seen and what I have witnessed over the course of my career, uh, also prior to the Web Republic, it was that the technical evolution and the possibilities, they grow faster than the ability for humans to really understand what the technology actually can do, but also from a legal point of view have uh, laws and leg legislations that uh, identify certain parameters, what is to do. Uh, and some of the other companies that are out there, you used to work for Google yourself, I mean, are they aware of this? Are they aware of... Of the fact that, they, that well, the, the changes in regulation and the fact that Absolutely. people aren't as switched on Absolutely. as or they're, they're following the technology and they're far behind in following the technology? I think it's a... If you look at companies like Google or Facebook or many other large platforms, um, they are very aware what they can do mm -hmm. and they have to work very closely with uh, the regulatory uh, institutions to also understand where do they need to be careful and what data they can share. And, the, and this regulation, though, is going to get tighter. Absolutely. And this is happening right now, actually, in Europe, uh, especially with the GDPR. And that is a very good evolution. But I'm wondering if, if the actual Facebook incident itself is going to uh, propel the, the regulation to I'm be sure. tighter and more quick and come more quickly. Yes, I'm sure that this will actually propel, as you said correctly, that evolution or at least propel the discussion mm -hmm. around uh, data protection or, you know, the, the general question, what is happening with my data out in the web? Web Republic, for example, how are you using people's data? So, as I mentioned, we basically 
to look at the data aggregated by the platforms where we run the campaigns from. Uh, and uh, generally, the one of still one of the very important data points there is is looking at the IP address. Did you interact with a banner or did you not? Right? So if you interacted with a banner, you can see, oh, you bought, for instance, a, a shoe or you filled out a contact form. Mm -hmm. And depending on your uh, the action that you did there, we can understand uh, where, you, uh, where you targeted well and was it relevant. And I think this is a very important point. Um, we can use data and targeting to make the communication to you more relevant. And this is, a, this is our mission. So people shouldn't necessarily be frightened by what's happened no. with Facebook and the fact that data is being sold about them. No. But it can be a positive thing. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, we, first of all, we need to be aware this is a very young discipline that we're in. And uh, if I receive more relevant information, it's an added value for me. Yet, I also should be involved in the discussion what, uh, what is happening actually with my data. And I think this is happening right now. And how do you see the data ad business going in the future? So first of all, I think uh, there still needs to be a stronger understanding of large corporation. Uh, first of all, what data do they aggregate? How does the data infrastructure look? Uh, where do or where might they have a data leak? The question is not if there will be another data leak somewhere. The question is when, right? So uh, do the larger corporations actually have a, a... And I'm really referring here to the C-level and to the board level, that in my point of view still need to have a better understanding of, first of all, the web in general, but in that context also the technical infrastructure right. in which it's holding. Tom Hannan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Well, there's much more to come here on The Living Markets, but first, here's a look at the foreign exchange rates brought to you by Swissquote. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. On our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. News programs are usually full of short stories that hardly go beneath the surface. We give you the big picture. Every weekday evening at 7 p.m., the big picture goes deeper looking at an issue from different angles and bringing you the guests who take time to speak, explain and elaborate. Our viewers get a deeper understanding of the day's issues and the context that underlies them. The Big Picture, weekdays from 7 to 8 p.m. How do you make sure you're feeling good? We'll be focusing on all the tools available to us today to make sure we're physically and mentally healthy. From monitoring and avoiding disease to reactive and preventative health care. In particular, we'll be delving into the latest innovation coming out of Switzerland to ensure a long and healthy life. Feeling Good with Amanda Kane on CNN Money Switzerland. The Newsmaker is the ultimate talk show where the biggest names in Switzerland tell you their most important stories. We delve into the economy, markets, politics, real estate, media, technology and more sharpen your mind and broaden your horizon. Every weekday from 8 to 9 p.m. Entertainment, culture, fashion, arts and lifestyle. We've got it covered on Spotlight. Spotlight, 
with Anna Maria Montero on CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, watch CNN Money Switzerland. Welcome back. You're watching The Living Markets on Friday, the 23rd of March. Now, as the global sell-off continues, it's time to take a look at what really is going on. Monetary policy is tightening, a trade war is looming, and debt, particularly in the United States, is an issue. At the end of the day, it's all about how to get out of emergency mode. Well, earlier I spoke to Matt Egan, Vice President of Loomis Sales & Company, about how they are managing the economic trends. The, the nice thing for the Fed is the looking at the U.S. economy is it's generally uh, normalized enough to allow them to normalize policy. So it means what we call in the business the term structure. Uh, it means yields are going to lift, and they already have, but we see more of this happening. And I, I think, you know, we can look out over the next couple of years and see, for example, the benchmark 10-year rate, U.S. rate, at maybe 35 4%. So this is, good, this is good news then for, for pensions, for savers? It's very good news, right? So they, um, all along, pension, I have a lot of pension clients, and they've been moaned the fact that they can't re reach their return hurdles in the fixed income markets, and it's forced them to take more and more risk, generally by pushing out the curve, going down in quality, or accepting a degree of illiquidity in their portfolios. So this gets, it makes it a little bit easier. The challenge is, is getting to that higher level of yield while preserving your principal. So yes, high yields are a good news for us as investors longer term, but the challenge is we don't want to lose principal from rates, the rate, uh, the upward trend in rates right now. So where do you see markets going from, from this point? So if we take the, you know, the Fed and the Treasury is going to clear the market. Um, I think that there's a couple of factors that are going to boost rates uh, near term. One of them is the Fed policy. We just heard from the Fed. And the market is kind of caught up to the notion that the Fed is going to continue to raise rates at a gradual pace. Uh, my guess is that um, the economy and inflation will be strong enough for the Fed to raise the short rate, which is what they control, to a level of say three and a half percent. That would mean inflation running, you know, maybe two and a half percent and real rates running at maybe 50 basis points. So not, you know, earth shattering, but you know, it's a fair amount higher than where we are today at one and three quarters percent. That would push the long end uh, in our estimation closer to the three and a half percent range, maybe as high as 4% for the 10 year part of the curve. Uh, and why is there such a difference between the duration in bonds? Well, the, the longer um, a bond's maturity, the, the, lo the higher its duration, and we, we, we talk about that in years, the higher the duration, the more sensitive it is to changes in interest rates. So as rates in the long end go higher, a 30-year Treasury bond can fall in price by a lot. So you can have a capital loss. And that's what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. It's great yields are going higher. That's the good news. The bad news is they're going higher, right? So. <laughs> We need to be able to, um, one, one clear strategy is for a bond investor, a manager, and what we've done in our portfolios is taking our duration a lot. So we're running with uh, what is a relatively short duration for us. Shorter duration bonds have less sensitivity to that rate move. Okay. And, so, and so that's how we're defending against that. 
And then, I suppose, in, in a third hand, you also have politics playing right. into this as well. How does that affect your strategies? Well, we uh, were as much, uh, we have to analyze uh, as political scientists as we are uh, investment managers more so than ever. Um, you know, recently it's just affected when we think about the, uh, the fiscal spending that is taking place in the United States. So the tax bill, um, you know, it's, it's strange to have fiscal thrust at a time where the economy is at full employment. It's very strange. And that'll have two effects. One is that pushes up rates. Um, and, and, and can be inflationary. Uh, secondly, though, is it adds, and something that I think is less well understood is it adds to the amount of supply of treasury debt that needs to clear the market. And this go hand in hand, goes hand in hand with the Fed's quantitative tightening. So relative to what has had to clear the markets over the past two or three years, we're going to see an explosion in debt that has to clear the private sector and not you know, have the luxury of having a central banker there to buy it. And how does that happen? So we have auctions in the United States. Uh, every, every week almost there's an auction for, it could be T-bills out to the 30-year note. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the Treasury will set the auction date and they, they have an auction and it clears the market. Treasuries clear the market. They set the rate for almost every other obligation around the planet. And um, it's a supply and demand thing. And what we're starting to see already this year, we've, we've witnessed some indigestion in the auctions, meaning that the, the cover of what's bid for and what's offered is not so good as it used to be. And that's just a reflection of supply coming to the market. And the most, most of the supply is on the shorter end of the curve, the T-bills. And that's what's causing the short end of the curve irrespective of what the Fed funds rate is doing, like T-bills, mm -hmm. LIBOR. People probably have noticed that LIBOR is now above, you know, it's two and a quarter, uh, which is, you know, a and lot so higher. And you really kind of seeing this Fed versus the politics right yes. now. It's really yeah. kind of coming into play. For sure. And uh, the Fed is always asked, you know, how do you take into consideration this fiscal policy? And they have to take it into consideration. And they're, um, you know, they have to lean against that to a certain degree. And then we talk about trade policy, which is a whole other uh, can of worms. So in this whole Fed versus the politics, who, who do you think wins in the end? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, look, you know, the, Fed, the Fed's mandate is uh, stable um, prices, full employment. Simple as that. And they're going to be bound to that, um, their, whatever their role is in, in playing that. And so to the extent fiscal policy affects that, and maybe makes the economy run on the hotter side, they're going to lean against that and have to raise rates higher than they otherwise would. And, you know, up until recently, we felt like, you know, this year a lot of uh, the market was pricing at just about three rate hikes. And I was kind of leaning towards maybe four because inflation is actually showing signs of actually picking up and so on. The economy is pretty hot in the U.S. Um, now, though, you look at what's kind of taking place on the other side of the political spectrum in the trade fight, and that's not good for economic growth. OK, well, we'll have to wait and see yeah. how it all plays out. Matt Egan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. All right, let's talk uh, sports now. The Formula One Rolex Australian Grand Prix will get underway tomorrow. The big question is how the Swiss Alfa Romeo Sauber F1 team is placed. My colleague Anna Maria Montero discussed this and more with our sports correspondent Matt Layton earlier today. Let's talk about sports, baby. Let's talk about you and me and sports, Matt Layton. It's great to see you. Hello, good evening. Grand Prix weekend. I guess that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's, let's do it. So Formula One season is starting this Sunday, Melbourne, Australia. Now, I've heard that the Swiss have a great presence, but nobody on the starting line this Sunday. Well, that's correct if we look at the uh, nationality of the drivers. However, we do have a Swiss team. It's the Honourable Sauber team who've been in existence for many decades and they are in the lineup today. Today they had two practice sessions. Unfortunately, they came the 19th and 20th fastest. The problem is there's only 20 cars in the actual race. 
they're actually one thousandth of a second apart. Now, I've calculated if you're going 200 kilometers an hour, one thousandth of a second is five and a half centimeters. And this is over a 5.4 kilometer track. So they're very, very close there. But yes, we have the, the sour presence. There are uh, uh, fairly uh, new drivers. There is there's a 20 year old Charles Leclerc. Now, he could be a possible world champion. He's so far won all the races and all the, uh, the categories he's been in before. He's in the F2 last year. He's been brought, there is a new picture. He's been brought along by Ferrari. And they say he's one of the most talented drivers of all time. It's very rare. He's actually born in Monaco and he still lives there. And the other driver for, for Sauber. He's been in the team now for this is his fourth season. And this, of course, is Marcus Ericsson, uh, 27 years old from Sweden. Hasn't yet won. His best position, I believe, is eighth. But uh, yes, it's uh, it's disappointing so far. I think Sauber are are struggling. They have obviously the great partnership now with Alfa Romeo, which is going to give them a lot of credibility, a lot of money. They're using the Ferrari engine, which quite a few teams are. So hopefully they can come better in the season. The actual way it works this weekend, practicing today, we've had tomorrow, Saturday, there's going to be a practice session and the qualifications and Central European time, six, 10 minutes past six in the morning on Sunday is going to be the Melbourne Grand Prix. Now we can see that uh, these are all young gentlemen that are yeah. in the lineup. We don't see any women. What is going on with that? But but before you say there are no women, because there aren't, Tatiana Calderon yeah. is part of the Sauber team. Is that right? Well, that's great. Last year, Tatiana Calderon, who's 24 years old from Colombia, was a test driver, and now she's been promoted to their number one reserve driver, which is which is really, really good news for her. Historically, though, no, women driving in Formula One weekends, there's only been two, unfortunately, and the last one was 40 years ago. So hopefully Tatiana can come through. But yes, it is, uh, it's something that needs to be addressing. The actual, uh, the people who know about it, they say, well, it's a pyramid, and it's mainly boys who start at the age of 10 or 12 in, uh, in go-karts, and it's very, very tough. There's only 20 year drivers in the world who get this far. And so it's a pyramid. But yes, there's a new uh, a new scheme that was introduced in the Geneva Motor Show a couple of weeks ago to get more top young women driving go-karts. Exactly. Well, like many things, it's all in the pipeline, right? The women aren't exactly. in the pipeline. There's no way they can make it to the top of the pyramid. Now, what about this racing season? What's What's new in terms of drivers and cars? I mean, what can you tell us? Well, the talking point that everyone who knows about Formula One is the halo. And this is a titanium piece of metal, like a fork shape, that hits over your head, sits over your head to protect you from flying objects. If it saves a life, then it was wonderful. Aesthetically, it's not great. And people are saying, there you go, in your picture, people are saying, unfortunately, it, it may have a effects on visibility. The other major thing, I suppose, the technical thing is last year, they had four engines to go through the whole season. This year, they only have three engines. That's an average of seven races each. Apart from that, lots of small technical changes. But in general, these are cars that weigh about 730 kilograms, 33 kilograms to be precisely, with their drivers inside. They're approaching a thousand horsepower and they're just amazing. They've got nine possible changes of tyres and it's going to be one of those for technical people. It's, it's so fascinating to see who performs best. But to be honest, it's all about money. The teams with the most money have the biggest development powers and then they put it forward. So far, in practice so far, Lewis Hamilton, he's already won the World Championships four times for Great Britain in the Mercedes car. He actually is the fastest so far. You just brought up money. In terms of money, you can't do any of this without the right sponsors, right? And now we've got Rolex and UBS are two of the high-profile sponsors. Um, how are they involved? Well, you couldn't get any more prestigious brands than these two, could you? Rolex has been involved since 2013. They're actually a naming partner, so they're actually on. It's called the 2018 Rolex Australian Grand Prix. And uh, UBS, obviously, the prestigious Swiss bank, they've been involved in some level since 2010. They're now a major partner with Mercedes. They actually do have a presence in Monte Carlo, but it just shows that uh, there's many, many millions. They see their, their, their badge on, on the driver. They have many, many millions of dollars flying here. And it's really good for the marks there because they get good credibility and obviously good marketing possibilities. I'm only reading it because I missed it. And I do hope that moving forward, especially looking towards this uh, Formula One season, we have an opportunity to ring it for our Sauber team here in Switzerland. Thank you, as always, Matt, for this tons of information. Thank you very much. All right, well, up next, we're heading to Basel World, where Bell and Ross CEO lets us in on his very high-end online strategy for staying in the watch game.
Since the founding of the Red Cross in 1863, the city of Geneva has a long tradition of hosting international organizations. In our program, International Geneva, we'll be exploring issues of international cooperation, humanitarian assistance and human rights, and talk to international players about the challenges and solutions to global problems. International Geneva with Martina Fuchs on CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV, on our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. The best Swiss business news whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. How do you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation, business opportunities anywhere. What drives the Swiss business world? What makes the economy tick? And how do companies react to the ever-changing challenges of the markets? We've got our finger on the Swiss pulse. We'll bring you the ups and downs, bulls and bears of the world of business, always asking what it means for you. The Swiss pulse, weekdays from 6 to 9 p.m. of the business day, we're only just getting started. On the living markets from 6 to 7 p.m., we crunch the numbers on the financial markets, bring you the top analysis of the day, and set the agenda for tomorrow. Always with Switzerland important global links in mind. The living markets, weeknights from 6 to 7 p.m., only on CNN Money Switzerland. Welcome back to Living Markets here on the Swiss Pulse, where we continue with our coverage of Basel World 2018. Now, if you're in the market for a new timepiece and are really ready to splurge, and I mean really, luxury watch company Bell & Ross is just the thing for you. Now, it's called the BRX1 Skeleton Tourbillon Sapphire. This is it. This is a picture of it, anyway, behind me. It's sold exclusively online and can be yours for a mere $480,000. Ana Maria Montero had a chat about this and more with Bell & Ross CEO, Carlos Rocio. So, Carlos, this is your 24th Basel World. Absolutely. What has been the most striking change for you thus far? Well, um, probably the change of this small fair, which has begun become a big one, and probably the latest evolution, which is about the evolution with the digital that gives also a platform to communicate worldwide in a very efficient way, I would say. Now, we were talking earlier, you know, this year there are half as many exhibitors as there were just three years ago. Why are you still here? Well, because I think it's still an efficient place as a marketplace to meet the retailers, to meet all the professions and to meet the media and to communicate what we have been doing in terms of creativity. We are a creative brand. We invest in R&D, in products, and I think the best way to give a perspective is to meet all the people who are related to our business during this place. 
And you feel like it really is efficient for this kind of thing? I think so, I think. Um, and there is a kind of stimulation even, uh, probably, uh, maybe there were too many uh, competitors or too many people. And this, is, this might be one of the reasons why they are half right now. But I think it was a that the ones, out, yes, maybe. this is the nature of economy, mm -hmm. which uh, goes up and down. But the ones who know where they want to go, still survive and know how to be efficient. Because also, when you look around, this is not an inexpensive event. This is a big investment for absolutely. you. Absolutely, but it was. It's uh, you're absolutely right. But it's worth doing it when your proposal is right and you when you meet the right people the distribution the retailers who appreciate what you have been doing and who then give you uh, the money of your, your investment the the payback because they buy and there is also a big audience who expect from basel to understand about every brand and the one who stands out are the one who have the most performing creativity i would say so am I understanding that it's more about brand value than it is actual sales? It's both. It's both. Uh, uh, you can make a lot of sales if your proposition is strong, efficient, and if you have the right network. I think that some people will consider that it's more about, uh, uh, about communication. For us, it is both. It is uh, We have, as you have seen on our booth, we have an entrance for press, an entrance for sales and we do both and we do both in a very efficient way you're all about efficiency here Valen Rossa. well i think uh, uh, and not only efficiency in a business sense is very important pleasure about watches having pleasure having emotion is very important if there is no emotion then i don't know how to make that one person would buy our watches on Bell & Ross. <laughs> would you consider going to other fairs outside of this one? Uh, Smaller? Nothing is fixed in the future. I would say that uh, today we are very happy with uh, what we're doing here. But um, we also do, for instance, a show in the United States, which is in Las Vegas which is also very good. It's uh, couture. There is all the, it's more maybe related to jewelry, but we have been one of the first watches company to go there in the winds. Very beautiful. We meet there with more time, all the American distribution. It's also very good. It means that there is the international, which is probably in Basel or in Geneva for some of them, some brands. And after, there is the American or the uh, Asian ones, which is another th uh, way to exhibit. Besides events like Basel, Basel World yes. and other fairs, you said Las Vegas, Asia, there's also now the digital component, which is a whole other way to build up your brand. Yes. Uh, I think we have been very innovative in that sense because Bell & Ross was one of the first watch brands to have a website in 1998. We were the first one to, in the luxury watches to have an e-boutique 10 years ago. And this year we are announcing something which is quite amazing because one of our high, high-end complications in Safai, which is uh, we, we have been doing three unique pieces, three different colors in Safai, very, very expensive for 100,000 euros, and two of them are only sold in the digital world, one by Mr. Porter, one by the Bell & Ross e-boutique. So you can only buy these 100,000 francs These 400,000 online. online, only available, two of them, absolutely. But it doesn't come to your house in a cardboard box. Uh, it will. <laughs> you, you, have, you, have, you have different <laughs> options to receive it. One of them is to be invited by us to go to the manufacturer and to meet the person, the watchmaker, who has made your watch. And of course, to meet me. <laughs> well, I, I've already had that privilege. Which so. is okay. not the most important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so again, we were talking earlier about how some of these stands are just amazing in scope and size and visually. Do you feel this pressure to have to 
do something really spectacular in order to stand out at Basel World? I think that the most important is the product, what you're wearing. But after, how do you show it? What is the story behind it? What is the message that you convey? It's also important. After, how do you express your message? There are different ways. There are some which are extremely expensive, but your message, the, uh, the most important is the strength of your message and the consistency. So, doesn't matter how flashy it is. No, I mean, it depends on the brand. There, 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 are, there are some brands, there are some brands who are very flashy, good for them. There are some brands who are understated, but who are straight to the point and who, because they are focused, they, they have a capacity to convince and to relay the information very e efficiently. Yeah. Earlier also we spoke about Chinese market very briefly. Um, the consensus is there is a revival happening there and also that they might be the lifeline for the switch watch industry. Do you agree? Uh, no. I personally think that in an international, international world, you must be really international and not putting all your eggs in the same basket. We have been very prudent, very careful about the Chinese market. We, ha we are invested in Asia, but not only in China. But I think that the international scope is very important and not only betting in China. It means that if, for instance, if a Chinese person, if you have developed the Chinese market and you go to the United States and the Chinese even do not see the brand in America or in Europe, there would be a lack of confidence. So my bet is that having an international network consistent is the most important. All right. So then just to wrap it up, you will be back for your 25. For sure, for sure. <laughs> and, and, you know, the most important in our brand uh, is the search of extremes. To be extremes in terms of product, but to be extremes also in terms of having a, a message, having a strategy that is sharp. Is there a fear that you're going to lose exclusivity because it's online? No, uh, it's a unique, it's anyway. a model which is unique. So. Yeah, at the contrary, it's the extreme of exclusivity. It doesn't change whether it is... That it's online, that you're doing online. Absolutely. At the end, you have a physical product and the connection, the way you get the information can be digital, can be physical. At one stage, you have the physical product on your waist. And this is the beauty of our business. So e-commerce is not... Is something to look down e on. E-commerce is, is a complementary and every brand needs to invent what is the link between e-commerce and luxury. But having a luxury distribution physical or having a luxury network online is the same selective distribution. And what do I have to buy to get a ride on your new plane? <laughs> well, for the moment, you can have the watches. <laughs> I have to buy four or five of these watches. The beer and then I get a ride yeah. on a new plane. We, we uh, you know, on the search of the stream, we have been in, uh, three years ago doing the B rocket that was on Bonneville. Uh, and after you, we had the race car with Aero GT. And now it's the plane, the beer bird, uh, which is a, a race bird, a race uh, flight. Are you going to go home on this? Bird? No. no. no, no, no. <laughs> right, thank you so much. My Adam. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Well, as Anna Maria just touched on there with Carlos Rocio, the Swiss watchmaking industry has seen a rebound in the last year, in part thanks to a recovery in exports to Hong Kong and mainland China. Now, this year, the Chinese mobile app WeChat and its payment platform WeChat Pay could provide a further boost and help the even more conservative Swiss luxury watch brands catapult into a new time era. Martina Fox has the story. This Chinese app is now turning the clock forward for traditional Swiss watchmakers, revolutionizing the way they are doing business. It's very simple. We have to adapt our platforms to the customer. If the customer is on WeChat, why shouldn't we go there? 
This is the world-famous Bahnhofstrasse, a shopping street in the heart of Zurich's financial center. Most Swiss watchmakers have their flagship stores here, including Omega. It's not only about distribution or marketing or product, it's also about being there, being close to our customers. And from a PR and communication point of view, I mean, we launched it already in June 2014. Because as you know, WeChat is not only a platform for social network, but it's also very good because you can add a lot of videos and a lot of information. So our customer, they like this emotional and informative part very much. WeChat is China's top instant messaging and digital payment services app developed by tech giant Tencent. It counts more than 960 million monthly active users, not far behind Facebook's Messenger and WhatsApp's 1.2 billion. A digital marketing strategy is key to succeed in the Chinese market, especially for exporters. After declining for more than two years, Swiss watch exports rose strongly at the start of 2018. Their value stood at 1.6 billion Swiss francs in January, which is a jump of 12.9 percent compared to last year. That trend was mainly thanks to strong growth in Asia, where Hong Kong posted its highest monthly increase for over five years. With a still stronger increase, China climbed up to second place. No wonder that Swiss watchmakers don't want to waste any time and jump on the bandwagon. Whoever has a doubt about China should immediately try to uh, think again because it is just phenomenal what will happen. The platforms are very popular among Chinese shoppers here. They scan the QR code of Swiss watch brands to follow and then buy their luxury timepieces at the shop. Times are now changing, especially since Tencent partnered with German payments firm Wirecard in November to allow European retailers to accept WeChat Pay as a payment option. I think going to the shop to see the watches first is good. Then buy them on the WeChat if the price is cheaper, of course that's better. Some, however, say they would still prefer to go to physical stores. Maybe at the beginning I will see uh, what kind of collections that are available um, through the WeChat. But after maybe I will come to shops. There are a lot of uh, different um, collections that I can select. And also just a little bit afraid that I could buy fake ones from the WeChat platform. It's a race against time, not only for Swiss watch companies, but also for WeChat Pay. So far, the app is mostly used by Chinese tourists visiting Europe and not really a challenger to the likes of Apple Pay, Samsung Pay or its bigger Chinese rival, Alipay. Martina Fuchs, CNN Money Switzerland in Zurich. All right, well, uh, here's a good Friday story for you. How do you like your tequila in a shot glass, in a margarita cocktail. Well, it could be that you're drinking your tequila all wrong, at least according to Bertha gonzalez nieves chief executive and co-founder of Casa Dragon. She tells the story of her brand's famous tequila and why the liquor is so misunderstood. You're about to find out how to really appreciate tequila. Tequila is so intertwined with the Mexican culture. It's really part of our social fabric, not only with our friends, but with our family. My name is Berta Gonzalez Nieves, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tequila Casa Dragones. We are here in San Miguel de Allende, one of the most beautiful colonial towns in Mexico. The Mexico that I see is the Mexico that I want to sell, that I want to export, and I like the world to see through the eyes of tequila. The misconception of tequila is that it's a spirit just to get drunk. Tequila is much more than that. Tequila really is a category that has 250 years of experience. And in those 250 years, there's been so much learning. We started with Casa Dragones Joven, which is in our label, it's a sipping tequila so that everybody knows that we wanted to deliver a style of tequila that actually invited you to sip and savior. 
Tequila in our culture is part of a table. And the idea of pairing tequila with food, not only Mexican food, but also of international cuisine. There's so many things that I love about San Miguel. One of it is its people. It's really the people that live here that really bring this town to, to life. Just walking on these streets, the beauty of the streets, the decoration of the houses, all the doors, all the details, and then you have this extraordinary view of this Mexican landscape that is really gorgeous. We want to continue to take tequila further. We can leave it in a better place, in a more advanced place, so that the new generations then can go further. Well, I hope that's got you in the Friday mood. That's it from us here on the Living Markets Hour tonight. Coming up next, though, is the big picture here on the Swiss Pulse. And it's all about Basel World and the world of jewellery and watches. Speaking of watches, don't forget that daylight savings time begins here in Switzerland at 2 a.m. on Sunday. I'm Hannah Wise. Thanks for watching. I'll see you for the Newsmaker in an hour. Do you want to see the latest gadgets? Understand where robotics will take us next? Find out more about the pioneers and their latest research? Join us on Tech Talk, where we'll be meeting the people behind the big ideas here in Switzerland and around the world and finding out what it means for businesses, consumers, and the planet. Tech Talk with Anna Maria Montero on CNN Money Switzerland. Money is more than just currency. It is the fuel for how we live our lives. It connects us. It drives us. It buys us things. But it is more than that. It is who we are and what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Money isn't everything, but it is everywhere, and so are we. We are younger, we are richer, and we are smarter. We are money. CNN Money. the world with Becky Anderson. It all starts here. Changing, fighting, creating, connecting. That's why we're here. We live here, we work here, we're from here. And we'll go wherever the story takes us. I'm Becky Anderson in Tehran. We are in Jerusalem. Real news that shapes our world. Exploring not just what's going on, but why. I just want to press you on one further point. Getting perspective on this region from this region. Places that many of us know, but few of us get to see. Observing countries on the move, still rooted in tradition. It all starts here, and that's why we're here, bringing you the world from our Middle Eastern hub. Connect the world with Becky Anderson. watch industry be in five years from now? As Basel World is pushed to reinvent itself, e-commerce and China are redefining the global market. And not all Swiss brands are up to the challenge. 
He single-handedly reshaped Japan's telecoms industry. Our newsmaker tonight, Sachio Semoto, is a top entrepreneur with a proven track record. He attributes his success to being bold and taking risks, but also in knowing that sometimes the best decision you can make in the business is to know when to let go, even when it means giving in to your fiercest competitors. So we sat down, we spent uh, 24 hours for a week, and we concluded it. Uh, we better sell our company and to let him control the future of the company. That was a better decision. Now SoftBank is a leading market leader. A very warm welcome. You're watching The Big Picture. I'm Martina Fuchs. Let's kick off the show. Now at the top stories making news here in Switzerland and around the world. Credit Suisse CEO Tijan Tiam took a pay cut in 2017 after shareholder uproar against his proposed renumeration. According to the Swiss Lenders' Compensation Report, published Today, Friday, Tiam received 9.7 million Swiss francs. That's 5% less than the year before. Credit Suisse posted a third consecutive loss in 2017, driven by a write-down on tax assets in the US. Tiam has asked shareholders to stick with the bank, promising higher capital returns for the coming year. The bank's executive board waived 40% of bonuses to quell criticism from shareholders. Hours after U.S. President Donald Trump ordered tariffs on $50 billion of Chinese imports, China fired back with levies on $3 billion of U.S. imports, including pork, recycled aluminium, fruit and wine. The White House also declared a temporary exemption for the EU and other nations on those levies, making the focus on China clear. Global stock markets dropped Friday amid rising tensions and trade war fears. Three people have been killed after a hostage situation in the south of France. It began when a man shot at four national police officers in Carcassonne, injuring one of them. French authorities say the same man then opened fire at a supermarket in the town of Trèbes. The gunman was shot and killed by police. The Paris prosecutor has confirmed to CNN that a murder and attempted murder investigation has been opened in connection with a terrorist incident in Trèbes. The EU has approved guidelines for the negotiation of future relations with the UK after it leaves the bloc next year. The text, which is discussed uh, by trade and security, among other things, clears the way for the next phase of Brexit talks to get underway. British Prime Minister Theresa May said there was a new spirit of cooperation and op opportunity. Negotiators say they want a deal on Britain leaving the EU by the end of the year. And the U.S. Senate has passed a $1.3 trillion spending bill this Friday that will avoid a government shutdown until September. Among its most significant provisions are pay rises for the military and incentives for states to enter more information into gun background checks. President Trump signed the bill into law today despite being unhappy about it, he said. President Trump also announced John Bolton will replace H.R. McMaster as U.S. National Security Advisor. Mr. Bolton is known for his radical approach to foreign policy. In particular, he ma maintains a hard line when it comes to North Korea and Iran. Bolton served as U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. under U.S. President George W. Bush. 
Zurich Airport has dropped one place in an airport's cleanliness ranking. In at number nine this year, the airport is still in the top ten globally. Geneva International is far behind, though, in 50th place. Asia tops the list. Skytrax, which carried out the report, put Singapore's Chang'e Airport in the top spot for the sixth year in a row. It's followed by Seoul's Incheon Airport and Tokyo's Haneda Airport. And coming up in tonight's big picture, the watch industry disrupted. After the break, we tell you how. It's all about Basel World, but first, a look at the weather for you. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland weekend weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. And the comfort indexes for some cities. Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. indexes. And we end with Sunday in Europe. And discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. Basel world has to reinvent itself, as we talked about yesterday, and this reflects very much how the Swiss watch industry is actually rethinking its own future. Digital is a game changer as much as the growing influence of the Chinese customers. Creativity also plays a key role in attracting the younger generations. And the goal is to make them buy watches. Mechanical timekeepers, where the Swiss watchmakers dominate the global market. Otherwise, millennials may just go for smart watches or no watches at all. This is a topic we investigate tonight in the big picture. Let's start with digital. How are e-commerce, websites and social media reshaping the market? And are the Swiss players up to speed? Anna Maria Montero was at Basel World where she spoke to David Sadik. He is the CEO of Digital Luxury Group, a Geneva-based consulting company, which has also an office in Shanghai. This week, uh, the company DLG released their 2018 World Watch Report on all of uh, the latest trends for luxury brands, as the report is sold at a price of $20,000. They'd better have some good information. And Maria kicked off by asking Sadik about the key findings of the report. You know, there are like many fascinating key yes. findings uh, as far as the, the report. What I think China, <laughs> you, you raised the point. I mean, uh, we had an analyst, a friend of the show, say to us the other day, it's six degrees of separation from China on just about anything. And of course, watches is no exception. Watches uh, are not exception. You are absolutely right. And, uh, you know, China now represents 21 percent, 21 percent of the total visits going to luxury watch website. And uh, not only it's 21%, but it's growing at a 35% year-to-year rate. Just to give you a comparison, the U.S. are at 11% only of the total traffic, uh, you know, going to watch websites, and they are stagnating. So I think, yes, China is definitely becoming not only important, but highly strategic as far as the luxury watch market is concerned. Well, and one of the, we were talking about earlier, one of the key instruments in this is the use of WeChat, which even Tag Heuer uses, I believe, right? Not yes, you know, I would say that generally speaking, now more than 80% of luxury brands, watch brands included, they are on WeChat. So WeChat is like uh, uh, becoming like the ultimate uh, uh, social network, micropayment solution, and so on in China. 
And it's also becoming the door for the brands who want to push information, you know, build their storytelling, making sure that they provide their customers with relevant information, not only for Chinese in China, but also to the Chinese travelers abroad, which, as you know, represent a very important potential uh, for the Swiss watchmaking industry. It's the Swiss watchmaking industry, then, I mean, the bottom line is depends on, will depend even more on Asia in the future. I would say that this was one of the important findings of the report, is that uh, with the amount of 21% of global traffic emanating from China and the level of growth at 35%, we can say that the destiny of the Swiss watch industry is now tied to China. Well, what about the Swiss? Are they digitally, are we in Switzerland digitally inclined at all? Or? I think Switzerland uh, on the digital side is quite uh, mature as a market. Uh, maybe the e-commerce part is a little bit less developed compared to some of the other European countries. Uh, but yes, I would say that globally speaking, digital uh, is quite important uh, here in Switzerland as well. All right, so let's talk about this digital marketing. There has obviously been a trend in consumer uh, mindset. Correct. Uh, I think we are like noticing a major shift uh, in the way you know people search, in the way people like uh, uh, look for information and so on. Uh, now we are like uh, seeing from clients, uh, from the watch brands, customers entering the shop and sometimes being even more informed than some of the store people themselves. You know, they have access to price transparency, they have access to lots of customers' reviews and so on. So I think all these make customers being much more knowledgeable and uh, being able to come much more informed uh, within the stores. And do you feel like the luxury brands are also jumping on that bandwagon or do you or do you find that they struggle a little bit that online is still perceived as being somehow less than i would say that everyone now all the brands are like moving in digital even if you look at the more traditional brands that have been a little bit more careful in developing their online visibility i think now they are like embracing digital and really try to build more compelling experiences and really trying to craft you know, unique piece of content that can be like showcased on the internet and so on. So I would say that uh, now digital is like a full reality for most of the brands, of course, with a lot of potential uh, development potential ahead. So we are at Basel World. Do you think this will be the last Basel World? I don't think so. I think we will still uh, see a few of uh, uh, Basel Worlds ahead, a couple of Basel Worlds ahead. So you're not pessimistic? No, I'm not that pessimistic, but I think the reality is that the digital disruption is happening everywhere and tra trade shows such as Basel World uh, are also being impacted. The reality is that, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, the need uh, and what the brands were expecting from a trade show like Basel World were not the same as, uh, you know, the need and the objectives that they have right now. If you look at the SEHH, you know, they have made significant progress in really becoming a hub and really trying to make sure that from the SEHH they can broadcast and have lots of places and content opportunities to help the brand in like broadcasting their messages. And I do feel that that's probably the path that Basel World will have to follow as well. You know, becoming a media and really helping them at like amplifying the voices of all the different like uh, 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 media influencers and so on that are attending the, the fair. So consolidating basically. Do you think the fair will consolidate? I think it will consolidate, but I think it has to evolve as well. And it has to evolve by embracing also, you know, digital disruption and influencer management, uh, etc., to ensure that Basel World remain a very important and influential uh, uh, trade show uh, for the watchmaking industry. So if we look forward, um, what are some other digital trends that we should keep a look out for you know i think e-commerce is like something extremely interesting at the moment uh, if you look at the us if you look at china which are obviously like the two biggest uh, market for the the swiss luxury watch industry uh, i think e-commerce is really becoming a reality um many even people for luxury products even for luxury product i think the reality is that it's not because at the end of the day you purchase the product from the internet 90 percent of i would say the the purchase process is happening online and at the end of the day, of course, uh, most of the people would like to try the watch on their wrist, making sure that things work that's well, well etc. Yes, there's um, always still that, right? People still want to have contact yes, with the product. Yes, they want to have contact yeah. with the product. That they spend a lot of money on. They spend a lot of money on, but in one other end, we are seeing like, uh, you know, more and more expensive products being sold on the internet. If you look at art galleries, for example, and contemporary arts, you can also see that uh, a very interesting trend and uh, important growth. So we do believe that more than 10% of the overall sales for luxury, Swiss luxury watch brand will happen online in the next five years. And what do you think, if anything, could disrupt this disruption? 
Is there a possibility of disrupting this trend towards e-commerce? I don't think so. Other than uh, power outage? No, globally. I don't. I, I don't think so. I think you know some of the brands are really trying to uh, uh, come with exclusive products that are being designed only for the e-commerce era and younger people and so on. But I think for most of the brands, uh, it will be absolutely critical uh, to jump uh, and uh, you know to find a way by still you know protecting their retail network and maybe by doing that you know in good intelligence with their current retailer but they will have to adapt and to embrace also the digital reality. And e-commerce is definitely like a core part of this digital disruption. So who for you is really setting a good example in terms of using e-commerce to, to sell their, their products? You know, I've seen like uh, many brands doing a great job at like uh, pushing online. I would say that two recently that stand out are like uh, Tag Heuer and IWC, uh, which both have been like uh, launching very interesting initiatives on, on e-commerce. Uh, IWC just a few days ago announced that uh, they are providing for the US market a watch configurator that allow you to really customize your watch where you can also then see it on a wrist uh, to really have an idea of how your, your watch look like. I think we should expect much more initiatives uh, going in that direction uh, across the industry. And then Tag Heuer, of course, they sell even in China on JD.com, which is what, a rival of Alibaba, no? Yeah, that's correct. I think, you know, uh, e-commerce in China is really big. Uh, many brands try to sell directly through their own website, but also many, they have to, you know, push sales on Tmall, on JD, on other dedicated platform. So that's also an uh, extremely important uh, uh, strategy. Uh, and you have the same, I would say, in the US, in Europe, with uh, Net Apporté, for example, or Mr. Porter, uh, where you can also see more and more watch and jewelry brand really pushing and trying to be more visible in such uh, strategic platforms. When these brands go online, is there a feeling that they're losing exclusivity? I mean, it's a, it's a good point you are, you are raising here. Uh, I think, of course, exclusivity is one of the key, uh, you know, elements for, uh, to keep the, the brand desirability. So if you want people to desire your brand, you need to make sure that you, you keep this exclusivity element. But I do think it's possible to keep an exclusive, uh, you know, image uh, by going on the Internet. But this requires to have like a well thought, bespoke strategy and to avoid trying to be present everywhere and diluting the brand image. In the second part of our big picture, we will focus on design, creation and how the Swiss industry can also be successful without the famous Swiss made label. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. No, it's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first check or cashing big checks. To those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Quest Means Business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. News programs are usually full of short stories that barely go beneath the surface. We give you the big picture every weekday evening at 7 p.m. The big picture goes deeper, looking at an issue from different angles and bringing you the guests that take time to speak, explain and elaborate. Our viewers get a deeper understanding of the day's issues and the context that underlies them. The big picture, weekdays from 7 to 8 p.m. It's high energy and fast paced, so buckle up as Front Seat brings you the latest news and views from the automotive world. Car developments, industry news, interviews with successful drivers, the latest trends and next level innovation here in Switzerland and around the world. On Front Seat, we'll keep you on the right road. Front Seat with Hannah Wise on CNN Money Switzerland. The newsmaker is the ultimate talk show. 
where the biggest names in Switzerland tell you their most important stories. We delve into the economy, markets, politics, real estate, media, technology, and more to sharpen your mind and broaden your horizon. Every weekday from 8 to 9 p.m. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, watch CNN Money Switzerland. Welcome back to the big picture. Swiss watch brands market themselves as masterpieces, promoting a glorious Swiss-made past. But is that truly what customers are after? What if Swiss watchmakers capitalized on globalization and focused on bringing new designs and on creating new brands? We delve into that tonight in the second part of the big picture, as Basel World, the largest watch fair, is now open to the public through next week. Early this week, my colleague Amanda Kane spoke to Daniel Niederer. He is the founder and CEO of Seven Friday, a Swiss company that designs and creates its watches here in Switzerland, but produces them in Asia. Seven Friday was created with only 50,000 francs in 2012 and now produces 25,000 pieces a year. Amanda first asked him if he was going to Basel World. Basically, in the last six years since we exist, we have never exhibited in Basel. Uh, we're going there to meet our friends and our, some of our customers, surely, but more for drinks and food, more for lifestyle rather than for business. I mean, I'm in the industry since 20 years, so I know two or three people. Now, you're Swiss uh, designed, but not Swiss made. Does that allow you to be freer in what you create? I, I don't know. I, I think it, we have a freer choice of movements because very often the movement makes or gives you an indication of which direction you go with the design because it's an arrangement of the components. So having more movements available and not being restricted to the Swiss made obviously gives us a certain liberty. Um, otherwise, I think it's more the use of the brand who gives us the liberty to take certain steps which maybe more traditional brands wouldn't do because they have to respect, obviously, the history they have. Unlike most luxury brands, your watches are, are fairly reasonable when all considered. Why did you decide to pick this lower end of the market? Well, I, I would think some cultures would argue the lower end of, uh, of the price point, but I sold watches in my past up to a million dollar, anything in between, and I didn't really feel, feel very good about it. Besides, I often think it takes a lot more creativity, a lot more work to get something extraordinary in terms of quality, in terms of design, in terms of uniqueness at the lower price point. If the price doesn't matter, I construct anything you want because you have all the time, I have all the resources available. But to do it with less and give a proposition that is a true value proposition to the customer as well, even so that's not the first, hopefully, intention to buy the brand, I think that's the real challenge. So are a lot of the Swiss watches out there overpriced, in your opinion? That's not up to me to charge, but I guess... <laughs> I think some are overcharged, uh, overpriced. Um, I think the, the recent developments in the Swiss watch industry or maybe a little bit a testimony to that it went too far. Um, that's at least my opinion, but then again, everybody does as they want. We have our philosophy, our price point, and very honestly, we don't consider ourselves part of the watch industry. So your watch is a Swiss design, but actually not Swiss made, they're made elsewhere? Correct, correct. In Asia? In Asia, we produce, the movement is Japanese, the rest of the components we produce in China, Fantastic partners since the beginning, supported us in building this enterprise. It wouldn't have been possible without. So, not an easy thing to launch uh, a watch brand. Uh, how much money do you need to start such a business? <laughs> um, we had, before I started the, the brand, I was partnering in a design studio, so there was certain support function we had, obviously, in terms of design 
So we have our own design studio and in terms of development. So maybe time and labor we had available and we didn't have to pay for. In terms of cash, it was 50,000 Swiss franc. And typically, how is that sort of money raised? How did you raise it? Savings, lost savings. <laughs> okay, good. And uh, in terms of uh, success, how do you, at what point are you successful in your mind? I mean, there's, there's, there's many different elements. Obviously, there's always a fiscal part, whether we like it or not, whether we're in this branded world and all emotional, and we're all happy chappies. But there is obviously the financial part, which makes you survive. You got the family, or I got the family, and I need to, you know, provide for them. And um, obviously, one thing is you live from it. Um, that's a, a, a confirmation of what you did. The second thing is when people start calling you. When I started Seven Friday, I started really from the bottom again. I was restructuring companies before, I had a secretary, I had a, an assistant, and suddenly you're alone. You're alone in an office and you do the invoicing, you do the logistics, you do everything. And then when somebody suddenly calls from the US, I remember it was a gentleman from the middle of the US and he called me up and his message was only, hey, by the way, I am Seven Friday. So people got the message of the brand very quickly and replied to it without even just buying the watch itself. I think that was another element which, for me, was extremely satisfying. Because if, just because I have an idea doesn't mean that people react the way I want. And the other element was basically the press, which picked up very quickly on this Northern Swiss made and on the design language we have. So very quickly they realize the design language, the inspiration we have behind, behind our products. And the inspiration being that you wanted every day to be like a Friday. No, that's the philosophy. Friday. That's the philosophy. So the philosophy every day is a Friday, uh, not because it's happy hour when we get drunk, but more because it's, you know, you're waiting for the weekend, you're waiting for good things to happen, people are in a positive mood. So why is it always Friday? Why can't it be every day a week? What is so bad about that? Why does a job have to be miserable? Why do I have to feel miserable if I go on a Monday morning to work? So that's what I don't want to have. That's why I call it Seven Friday, because that's my ambition. Now, the other one is the design language, the inspiration of the designs itself. So all our designs are industrial inspired. And a lot of those designs have been copied. And some of the videos out there, when you look for Seven Friday, the most hits that you've got on your videos are how to copy it. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about that? Well, I got uh, really upset, obviously, and then some people said, yeah, but you know, copy is the highest form of flattery. So yes, I feel flattered, but at the same time, it's really super annoying because it costs a lot of money. I mean, the whole development process, people underestimate the design because to keep, as I said before, our products in the price range we have and constantly redefine on such a small space, the aesthetics, the materials and everything is really a huge challenge, so it doesn't come for free. So you feel like people being very opportunistic about that. Let's talk sports now. And the Formula One Rolex Australian Grand Prix will get underway tomorrow. The big question is how the Swiss Alfa Romeo Sauber F1 team is placed. My colleague Anna Maria Montero discussed this and much more with our sports correspondent Matt Layton earlier today. Let's talk about sports, baby. Let's talk about you and me and sports, Matt Layton. It's great to see you. Hello, good evening. Grand Prix weekend. I guess that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's, let's do it. So Formula One season is starting this Sunday, Melbourne, Australia. Now, I've heard that the Swiss have a great presence, but nobody on the starting line this Sunday. Well, that's correct if we look at the uh, nationality of the drivers. However, we do have a Swiss team. It's the Honourable Sauber team who've been in existence for many decades and they are in the lineup today. Today they had two practice sessions. Unfortunately, they came the 19th and 20th fastest. The problem is there's only 20 cars in the actual race. They're actually one thousandth of a second apart. Now, I've calculated, if you're going 200 kilometres an hour, one thousandth of a second is five and a half centimetres. And this is over a 5.4 kilometre track. 
So they're very, very close there. But yes, we have the, the Sauber presence. There are uh, fairly uh, new drivers. There is there's a 20 year old Charles Leclerc. Now he could be a possible world champion. He's so far won all the races and all the uh, the categories he's been in before. He's in the F2 last year. He's been brought there. He's a new picture. He's been brought along by Ferrari, and they say he's one of the most talented drivers of all time. It's very rare. He's actually born in Monaco and he still lives there. And the other driver for for Sauber, he's been in the team now for this is his fourth season. And this, of course, is Marcus Ericsson, uh, 27 years old from Sweden. Hasn't yet won. His best position, I believe, is eighth. But uh, yes, it's uh, it's disappointing so far. I think Sauber are are struggling. They have obviously the great partnership now with Alfa Romeo, which is going to give them a lot of credibility, a lot of money. They're using the Ferrari engine, which quite a few teams are. So hopefully they can come better in the season. The actual way it works this weekend, practicing today, we've had tomorrow, Saturday, there's going to be a practice session and the qualifications and Central European time, six, 10 minutes past six in the morning on Sunday is going to be the Melbourne Grand Prix. Now we can see that uh, these are all young gentlemen that are yeah. in the lineup. We don't see any women. What is going on with that? But but before you say there are no women, because there aren't, Tatiana Calderon yeah. is part of the Sauber team. Is that right? Well, that's great. Last year, Tatiana Calderon, who's 24 years old from Colombia, was a test driver, and now she's been promoted to their number one reserve driver, which is which is really, really good news for her. Historically, though, no, women driving in Formula One weekends, there's only been two, unfortunately, and the last one was 40 years ago. So hopefully Tatiana can come through. But yes, it is, uh, it's something that needs to be addressing. The actual, uh, the people who know about it, they say, well, it's a pyramid, and it's mainly boys who start at the age of 10 or 12 in, uh, in go-karts, and it's very, very tough. There's only 20 year drivers in the world who get this far, and so it's a pyramid. But yes, there's a new, uh, a new scheme that was introduced in the Geneva Motor Show a couple of weeks ago to get more top young women driving go-karts. Exactly. Well, like many things, it's all in the pipeline, right? The women aren't exactly. in the pipeline. There's no way they can make it to the top of the pyramid. Now, what about this racing season? What's, what's new in terms of drivers and cars? I mean, what can you tell us? Well, the talking point that everyone who knows about Formula One is the halo. And this is a titanium piece of metal, like a fork shape, that hits over your head, sits over your head to protect you from flying objects. If it saves a life, then it was wonderful. Aesthetically, it's not great. And people are saying, there you go, in your picture, people are saying, unfortunately, it, it may have a effects on visibility. The other major thing, I suppose, the technical thing is last year, they had four engines to go through the whole season. This year, they only have three engines. That's an average of seven races each. Apart from that, lots of small technical changes but in general these are cars that weigh about 730 kilograms 33 kilograms to be precisely with their drivers inside they're approaching a thousand horsepower and they're just are amazing they've got nine possible changes of tires and it's going to be one of those for technical people it's uh, it's so fascinating to see who performs best but to be honest it's all about money the teams with the most money have the biggest development powers and then they put it forward so far in practice so far lewis hamilton he's already won the world championships four times for great britain in mercedes car he actually is the fastest so far. You just brought up money in terms of money. You can't do any of this without the right sponsors, right? And now we've got Rolex and UBS are two of the high profile sponsors. Um, how are they involved? Well, you couldn't get any more prestigious brands than these two, could you? Rolex has been involved since 2013. They're actually a naming partner, so they're actually on. It's called the 2018 Rolex Australian Grand Prix. And uh, UBS, obviously, the prestigious Swiss bank, they've been involved in some level since 2010. They're now a major partner with Mercedes. They actually do have a presence in Monte Carlo, but it just shows that uh, there's many, many millions. They see their, their, their badge on, on the driver. They have many, many millions of dollars flying here. And it's really good for the marks there because they get good credibility and obviously good marketing possibilities. I'm only reading it because I missed it. And I do hope that moving forward, especially looking towards this uh, Formula One season, we have an opportunity to ring it for our Sauber team here in Switzerland. Thank you, as always, Matt, for this tons of information. Thank you very much. This year is an important one for Formula One driver Daniel Ricciardo, who is coming to the end of a five-year contract. Ricciardo wants Red Bull to provide a title-winning statement of intent at this weekend's season-opening Australian Grand Prix. Last year's championship was largely contested between Mercedes and Ferrari, but hopes are high for a three-way title battle this 
season. Red Bull finished 2017 with two wins from six races and Ricciardo feels the team has only improved since then. I'm the only Aussie, you know, currently on the grid, so there's the hype, the attention of the first race, and then you double that for me because naturally I've got more people interested in me back in Australia. Melbourne as a, as a race, as an event, I think does very well. You know, a lot of the team, a lot of the other drivers really enjoy going there. As a fan, you get a really good experience. You've got other categories racing, you've got like normally things happening in the park, within the circuit, you know, freestyle motocross and some musicians playing. Um, the weather's normally pretty good, it's sunny, and the city's right around the corner. So you've got so many options um, around the race as well to, to keep you busy. Alrighty, so we're about to start a lap in Albert Park. Coming down the straight, it's pretty bumpy because it's a street circuit, but then you got Really nice right left, which I love, uh, which is turn one on and two into then a flat out right, which is uh, pretty fun in modern F1 cars. Then uh, another nice little right left, you get all up on the exit curbs, really throws you around quite a little quick flip flop. You'll see up on the hill to the left or up on the bank, massive crowd. It's normally some really big Aussie flags there, which is. Um, Always nice to see, which then flicks into, you know, two of my favorite corners on the track. Fast left and fast right, sixth, seventh gear. This kind of backside of the lake. There's a few local West Australian boys who always hold out this sign for me, and they're like running like mad men, trying to chase my, uh, my car, like my parade lap car. Um, and they're yelling out, come on Dan, do it for WA. So WA is West Australia. So yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Before the first race of the season, we'll do six days in the simulator, testing setups with what we've got currently on the car, which we can work with. So different types of suspension stiffness or you know little things like that, aerodynamics, uh, different wings. Um, lower downforce, high downforce, but also we can then potentially test things that will be on the car in, you know, two races time and we can actually see the difference and if that's the direction to keep pushing in. The sims are getting better and better. Like each year we drive them, they're getting more advanced, I guess closer to the real thing. It's probably like 85% real. So it's pretty close. If you were, I don't know, I'd put like a general video game at probably 15%. The Halo, I think the biggest difference it'll have is visually, you know, on from the fans' point of view. Um, you know, I've, I've done a few laps in it already and I honestly forget about it nearly immediately. Um, even though it's such a big structure, you, because you're always like looking forward and at the corner, like you kind of see through it, so you don't really even know it's there. And um, as far as like the approach to racing or the risks you take, zero changes. I'm quietly confident, you know, that uh, we're gonna start a lot stronger this season than, than we have in the previous seasons. You know, since my time at Red Bull, it's been, uh, it hasn't been a strength of ours, I guess, starting strong. Um, and when we did start strong in 2014 in Melbourne, we got disqualified, so. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, we've rolled the car out earlier this year. Um, the team has, I think, just been a bit more proactive with, with uh, getting the car prepared and not being too greedy or probably overconfident and then bringing it to Barcelona at the last minute, expecting it to run well, which, which it normally hasn't. So, uh, yeah, I think they've learned from um, the past, I guess, and, and we're now going to move forward and do very, very well and challenge the silver and red cars.
The Swiss watchmaking industry has seen a rebound last year, mainly thanks to a recovery in exports to Hong Kong and mainland China. This year, the Chinese mobile app WeChat and its payment platform WeChat Pay could provide a further boost and help even the more conservative Swiss luxury watch brands catapult into a new time era. Find out more here in my story. This Chinese app is now turning the clock forward for traditional Swiss watchmakers, revolutionizing the way they are doing business. It's very simple. We have to adapt our platforms to the customer. If the customer is on WeChat, why shouldn't we go there? This is the world-famous Bahnhofstrasse, a shopping street in the heart of Zurich's financial center. Most Swiss watchmakers have their flagship stores here, including Omega. It's not only about distribution or marketing or product, it's also about being there, being close to our customers. And from a PR and communication point of view, I mean, we launched it already in June 2014. Because as you know, WeChat is not only a platform for social network, but it's also very good because you can add a lot of videos and a lot of information. So our customer, they like this emotional and informative part very much. WeChat is China's top instant messaging and digital payment services app developed by tech giant Tencent. It counts more than 960 million monthly active users, not far behind Facebook's Messenger and WhatsApp's 1.2 billion. A digital marketing strategy is key to succeed in the Chinese market, especially for exporters. After declining for more than two years, Swiss watch exports rose strongly at the start of 2018. Their value stood at 1.6 billion Swiss francs in January, which is a jump of 12.6% compared to last year. That trend was mainly thanks to strong growth in Asia, where Hong Kong posted its highest monthly increase for over five years. With a still stronger increase, China climbed up to second place. No wonder that Swiss watchmakers don't want to waste any time and jump on the bandwagon. Whoever has a doubt about China should immediately try to uh, think again because it is just phenomenal what will happen. The platforms are very popular among Chinese shoppers here. They scan the QR code of Swiss watch brands to follow and then buy their luxury timepieces at the shop. Times are now changing, especially since Tencent partnered with German payments firm Wirecard in November to allow European retailers to accept WeChat Pay as a payment option. I think going to the shop to see the watches first is good. Then buy them on the WeChat if the price is cheaper, of course that's better. Some, however, say they would still prefer to go to physical stores. Maybe at the beginning I will see uh, what kind of collections that are available um, through the WeChat. But after maybe I will come to shops. There are a lot of um, different um, collections that I can select. And also I'm just a little bit afraid that I could buy fake ones from the WeChat platform. It's a race against time, not only for Swiss watch companies, but also for WeChat Pay. So far, the app is mostly used by Chinese tourists visiting Europe and not really a challenger to the likes of Apple Pay, Samsung Pay or its bigger Chinese rival, Alipay. Martina Fuchs, CNN Money Switzerland in Zurich. Up next, we are back to Basel World, where Bell and Ross CEO lets us in on his very high-end online strategy for staying in the game. We try to be global and we try to be smart. What I want to hear are authentic voices of people who are passionate, or intelligent, and that's the consistency that we try to get at. For Reed Zakaria GPS. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. What drives Swiss leaders? What is the secret to their success? In the Newsmaker, we speak to successful CEOs, entrepreneurs, politicians, decision makers, opinion leaders, sports and entertainment personalities. We find out what makes them tick in a special long-form interview that gets to the heart of who they are and where they are going. 
So pull up a chair and join us for the Newsmaker every weekday evening from 8 p.m. on CNN Money Switzerland. How do you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation, business opportunities anywhere. the Swiss business world, what makes the economy tick, and how do companies react to the ever-changing challenges of the market? We've got our finger on the Swiss polls. Well, we'll bring you the ups and downs, bulls and bears of the world of business, always asking what it means for you. The Swiss polls, weekdays from 6 to 9 p.m. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV, on our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. The best Swiss business news whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. Here on the Swiss Polls, we continue with our coverage of Basel World 2018. Well, if you're in the market for a new timepiece and ready to really splurge, luxury watch company Bell & Ross has just the thing for you. Called the BRX1 Skeleton Tourbillon Sapphire, seen here behind me, it is sold exclusively online and can be yours for a mere, take a guess, well, man, 480,000 US dollars. Anna Maria Montero had a chat about this and more with Bell & Ross CEO, Carlos Rosillo. So, Carlos, this is your 24th Basel World. Absolutely. What has been the most striking change for you thus far? Well, um, probably the change of this small fair, which has begun become a big one and probably the latest evolution, which is about the evolution with the digital that gives also a platform to communicate worldwide in a very efficient way, I would say. Now, we were talking earlier, you know, this year there are half as many exhibitors as there were just three years ago. Yes. Why are you still here? Well, because I think it's still an efficient place as a marketplace to meet the retailers, to meet all the profession and to meet the media and to communicate what we have been doing in terms of creativity. We are a creative brand. We invest in R&D, in products, and I think the best way to give a perspective is to meet all the people who are related to our business during this place. And you feel like it really is efficient for this kind of thing? I think so, I think. Um, and there is a kind of stimulation, even uh, probably uh, maybe there were too many uh, competitors or too many people. And this, is, this might be one of the reasons why they are half right now. But I think that the ones... Out, yes, maybe. this is the nature of economy, mm -hmm. which uh, goes up and down. But the ones who know where they want to go still survive and know how to be efficient. Because also when you look around, this is not an inexpensive event. This is a big investment for absolutely. you. Absolutely. But it's worth, it's, uh, you're absolutely right, but it's worth doing it 
when your proposal is right and you, when you meet the right people, the distribution, the retailers, who appreciate what you have been doing and who then give you uh, the money of your, your investment, the, the payback, because they buy. And there is also a big audience who expect from Basel to understand about every brand. And the one who stands out are the ones who have the most performing creativity, I would say. So am I understanding that it's more about brand value than it is actual sales? It's both. It's both. Uh, uh, you can make a lot of sales if your proposition is strong, efficient, and if you have the right network. I think that some people will consider that it's more about, uh, uh, about communication. For us, it is both. It is uh, we have, as you have seen on our booth, we have an entrance for press, an entrance for sales. And we do both. And we do both in a very efficient way. You're all about efficiency here at Valenrasa. Well, I think uh, uh, and not only. Efficiency in a business sense is very important. Pleasure about watches, having pleasure, having emotion is very important. If there is no emotion, then I don't know how to make that one person would buy our watches or Bell and Ross. <laughs> would you consider going to other fairs outside of this one? Uh, Smaller? Nothing is fixed in the future. I would say that uh, today we are very happy with uh, what we're doing here. But um, we also do, for instance, a show in the United States, which is in Las Vegas, which is also very good. It's uh, couture. There is, it's more maybe related to jewelry, but we have been one of the first watches company to go there in the winds. Very beautiful. We meet there with more time, all the American distribution. It's also very good. It means that there is the international, which is probably in Basel or in Geneva for some of them, some brands. And after, there is the American or the uh, Asian ones, which is another th uh, way to exhibit. Besides events like Basel, Basel World yes. and other fairs, you said Las Vegas, Asia. There's also now the digital component, which is a whole other way to build up your brand. Yes, uh, I think we have been very innovative in that sense because Bell & Ross was one of the first watch brand to have a website in 1998. We were the first one to, in the luxury watches to have an e-boutique 10 years ago. And this year we are announcing something which is quite amazing because one of our high, high-end complication in Safi, which is uh, we, we have been doing three unique pieces, three different colors in Safi, very, very expensive for 100,000 euros. And two of them are only sold in the digital world, one by Mr. Porter, one by the Bell & Ross e-boutique. So you can only buy these 100,000 francs. These 400,000 online. online, only available, two of them, absolutely. But it doesn't come to your house in a cardboard box. Uh, it will. <laughs> you, you, have, you, have, you have different <laughs> options to receive it. One of them is to be invited by us to go to the manufacturer and to meet the person, the watchmaker, who has made your watch. And of course, to meet me. <laughs> Well, I've already had that privilege. Which so. is not the most important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so again, we were talking earlier about how some of these stands are just amazing in scope and size and visually. Do you feel this pressure to have to do something really spectacular in order to stand out at Basel World? Uh, I think that the most important is the product, what you're wearing. But after how do you show it? What is the story behind it? What is the message that you convey? It's also important. After, how do you express your message? There are different ways. There are some which are extremely expensive, but your message, the, uh, the most important is the strength of your message and the consistency. So, doesn't matter how flashy it is. No, I mean it depends on the brand. There, 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 there are some brands. There are some brands who are very flashy, 
good for them. There are some brands who are understated, but who are straight to the point and who, because they are focused, they, they have a capacity to convince and to relay the information very eff efficiently. Yeah. Earlier also we spoke about the Chinese market very briefly. Um, the consensus is there is a revival happening there and also that they might be the lifeline for the switch watch industry. Do you agree? Uh, I personally think that in an international, international world you must be really international and not putting all your eggs in the same basket. We have been very prudent, very careful about the Chinese market. We, ha we are invested in Asia, but not only in China. But I think that the international scope is very important and not only betting in China. It means that if, for instance, if a Chinese person, if you have developed the Chinese market and you go to the United States and the Chinese even do not see the brand in America or in Europe, there would be a lack of confidence. So my bet is that having an international network consistent is the most important. All right, so then just to wrap it up, you will be back for your 25? For sure, for <laughs> sure. And, and, you know, the most important in our brand uh, is the search of extremes. To be extremes in terms of product, but to be extremes also in terms of having a, a message, having a strategy that is sharp. Is there a fear that you're going to lose exclusivity because it's online? No, uh, it's a unique, it's anyway. a model which is unique. So, yeah, at the contrary, it's the extreme of exclusivity. It doesn't change whether it is... it's online, that you're doing online. Absolutely. Product. At the end, you have a physical product and the connection, the way you get the information can be digital, can be physical. At one stage, you have the physical product on your waist. And this is the beauty of our business. So e-commerce is not is something to look down e on. E-commerce e is, is a complementary and every brand needs to invent what is the link between e-commerce and luxury. But having a luxury distribution physical or having a luxury network online is the same selective distribution. And what do I have to buy to get a ride on your new plane? <laughs> <laughs> well, for the moment, you can have the watches. <laughs> I have to buy four or five of these watches. <laughs> the and then I get a ride yeah. on your plane. We, we uh, you know, on the search of extreme, we have been in, uh, three years ago doing the B rocket that was on Bonneville. Uh, and after you, we had the race car with Aero GT. And now it's the plane, the B Bird. Uh, fly, which is a, a race bird, a race uh, flight. You're going to go home on this bird? No. no. no, no. <laughs> right, thank you so much. My Scott. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And that's it for the big picture. Up next is the newsmaker with my colleague Hannah Wise. Have a great weekend. Hasta la vista. Money is more than just currency. It is the fuel for how we live our lives. It connects us. It drives us. It buys us things. But it is more than that. It is who we are and what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Money isn't everything, but it is everywhere, and so are we. We are younger, we are richer, and we are smarter. We are money. CNN Money.
Newsmaker is the ultimate talk show where the biggest names in Switzerland tell you their most important stories. We delve into the economy, markets, politics, real estate, media, technology and more to sharpen your mind and broaden your horizon every weekday from 8 to 9 p.m. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. On our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, watch CNN Money Switzerland. He single-handedly reshaped Japan's telecoms industry. Our newsmaker tonight, Satya Simoto, is a dogged entrepreneur with a proven track record. He puts his success down to being bold and taking risks but also in knowing that sometimes you have to let go, even when it means giving in to your fiercest competition. So we sat down, we spent uh, 24 hours for a week, and we concluded that uh, we better sell our company and to let him control the future of the company. That was a better decision. Now SoftBank is a leading market leader. Also tonight, stock markets fluctuate as the trade war is still a big concern among investors. What about those rising oil prices and why is gold heading higher? Interesting moves today as the world economy is still picking up steam. Good evening, I'm Hannah Wise and you're watching the Newsmaker Hour here on the Swiss Pulse. Newsmaker Hour. I'm Hannah Wise. We've got started tonight with a roundup of the main news headlines. Credit Suisse CEO Tijin Tiam took a pay cut in 2017 after shareholder uproar against his proposed remuneration. According to the Swiss Lenders Compensation Report published today, Tiam received 9.7 million Swiss francs. That's 5% less than the year before. Credit Suisse posted a third consecutive loss in 2017, dr driven by a write-down on tax assets in the US. TM has asked shareholders to stick with the bank, though promising higher capital returns for the coming year. The bank's executive board waived 40% of bonuses to quell criticism from shareholders. Hours after US President Donald Trump ordered tariffs on $50 billion of Chinese imports, China fired back with levies on $3 billion of US imports, including pork, recycled aluminium, fruit and wine. The White House also declared a temporary exemption for the EU and other nations on those levies, making the focus on China clear. Global stock markets dropped Friday amid rising tensions and trade war fears. 
Three people have been killed after a hostage situation in the south of France. It began when a man shot at four national police officers in Carcassonne, injuring one of them. French authorities say the same man then opened fire at a supermarket in the town of Trèbes. The gunman was shot and killed by police. The Paris prosecutor has confirmed to CNN that a murder and attempted murder investigation has been opened in connection with a terrorist incident in Trèbes. The EU has approved guidelines for the negotiation of future relations with the UK after it leaves the bloc next year. The text, which discusses trade and security, among other things, clears the way for the next phase of Brexit talks. British Prime Minister Theresa May said there was a new spirit of cooperation and opportunity. Negotiators say they want a deal on Britain leaving the EU by the end of this year. The US Senate has passed a $1.3 trillion spending bill this Friday that will avoid a government shutdown until September. Among its most significant provisions are pay raises for the military and incentives for states to enter more information into gun background checks. President Trump signed the bill into law today despite being unhappy about it. Now, President Trump also announced John Bolton will replace H.R. McMaster as US National Security Advisor. Mr Bolton is known for his radical approach to foreign policy. In particular, he maintains a hard line when it comes to North Korea and Iran. Bolton served as US ambassador to the UN under US President George W. Bush. Now, Zurich Airport has dropped one place in an airport's cleanliness ranking. In at number nine this year, the airport is still in the top ten globally. Geneva International, however, is far behind in 50th place. Asia tops the list. Skytrax, which carried out the report, put Singapore's Changi Airport in the top spot for the sixth year in a row. It's followed by Seoul's Incheon Airport and Tokyo's Haneda Airport. All right, coming up is our newsmaker tonight. It's Sachio Simoto, who defied the odds to become one of Japan's most innovative and successful entrepreneurs. That's after the weather. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland weekend weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. And the comfort indexes for some cities. Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. Discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. Welcome back to the Newsmaker. Now, Japan is not necessarily known for its entrepreneurs. Bold small business leaders are scarce and corporate decisions tend to be made by a consensus. This was the prevailing mentality when our newsmaker, Satsuyo Simoto, first started back in 1966. His talents and a fierce drive pushed him to challenge the establishment in Japan and he turned a small company into one of the largest telecoms companies in the country. Currently chairman at Japanese company Renova Inc. He continues in that same vein to push boundaries and, as he says, to take risks. My colleague Amanda Kane caught up with Simoto at the Asia Leader Series in Zurich this week and she began by asking him how the latest trends in innovation are revolutionising his industry. Mr Simoto. Mm -hmm. You come from humble beginnings, if mm. I'm not mistaken. You're a self-made man. How did you do it? Well, 
I started uh, my life in, uh, with a state-owned monopoly company called NTT Public Corporation, which uh, was a state-owned company, 100% uh, monopoly by government uh, back in 1980s. And uh, 1985, the state-owned government was privatized by the leadership of Prime Minister then, Prime Minister Nakasone. And uh, NTT was privatized at the same time the competition was introduced. I'm the first man who founded the pure private competitor against gigantic NTT, whose uh, employees more than 350,000 gigantic employees. I, I started from scratch, just two of us, with five employees, and, uh, you know, try to compete against uh, NTT, and because the price at that time, 1985, was absurd, extremely high, uh, compared to United States or UK or Europe. So I thought there is a huge chance for us to compete and trying to uh, lower the telecommunication price to the global level. And you were successful. Yeah, fortunately, I started from scratch year uh, 1984, and I brought it up a uh, $5 billion company in 1990, IPO, and I gave 200 times return for the original investors. Competition today is fierce in all industries, especially in telecommunications. Mm -hmm. Does it still work the same today? I think the competition today is much, much comparatively easier uh, compared to the back uh, 1985 because the surrounding regulation laws and the government attitude public aptitude are uh, such more accommodative uh, for competition. So those days in the 80s, the competition was much more severe, much more difficult. But today we're seeing prices being squeezed beyond belief. Mm. How do companies stand a chance? That's a great question. I think that if you just focus on in infrastructure business, it's becoming more and more difficult because of uh, uh, severe competition, as you stated. But if you can add some kind of new technology, that including Bitcoin, those kind of stuff, by adding uh, values to the telecom infrastructures, there might be a, a superior opportunity going forward. Now, you're not a stranger to Switzerland, more so Geneva. You visited frequently in about the 80s. You helped to standardize mm -hmm. the telecoms industry with the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit more about that. In those days, the government uh, regulated telecommunication companies were major, major presence. There's no competition. So all the government, uh, just like the United Nations, they get together. They try to set the standard. But today, they are more entrepreneurs, uh, newcomers, new entrants. So standardization is somewhat different from those days. Uh, more entrepreneur, more risk-taking, more innovative, like uh, Facebook or Google, they set their own standard. So it's more interesting. It's more innovative. I enjoy this kind of trend more. And with today's world, telecommunications business, they don't really make their money from phone calls. Where is the revenue coming from today? I think uh, they are having uh, some additive uh, uh, value-added service uh, to the core infrastructure business. If they stick to core business, uh, as you said, the, the profit-making is almost impossible. They have to expand their business globally. They have to expand them vertically. So I think uh, cropped currency might be the next move. And also AI and IoT might be another field that they can expand. 
And what are your bold ideas when it comes to cryptocurrencies or artificial intelligence? How can they play a role in telecoms? I think it's an extremely interesting topic. Uh, now, government and rurals are somewhat uh, very uh, cautious and uh, giving warning to cryptocurrency. But my instinct tells me that cryptocurrency is the uh, future. And of course, the future risky business has some kind of limitations, some kind of fraud. But uh, its potential is uh, extremely huge, and we should take a, a good glance and focus on the cryptocurrency business. You just mentioned the word instinct. Is this something that's played a big role in your career, in your success? Is it needed to be a true entrepreneur? I think so. I definitely think so. That, that's a core of the success for, as an entrepreneur. What else? Is education important in your mind? Uh, education is extremely important, like uh, education in uh, Silicon Valley, Stanford, Berkeley. Those uh, university education are generating a bunch of new entrepreneurs on campus, uh, off campus. So education is uh, one critical issue. The other issue is education at home, parents' way of thinking, sense of values of the parents, to encourage kids, take more risk, uh, go abroad. Those kind of attitude is very important in the home education. And what do you think of the Swiss education? You were a board member of St. Gallen, University of St. Gallen, for a few years, uh, I understand. Yeah, that's a very interesting. Uh, back in 1980s, uh, the Swiss education was somewhat extremely conservative, like Japanese. But uh, toward the end of the 90s and the beginning of uh, 2000 afterwards, Swiss become uh, very entrepreneurial, uh, including Davos and St. Gallens. Uh, Swiss uh, becomes a, a, a model case, role model for other countries. And I respect and appreciate the Swiss education systems uh, very highly. So you think it's changed from the 80s to now? Yes, and tremendously. Any examples you can think of? Uh, if you look at this kind of uh, blockchain business or financial world in uh, Zurich, uh, I think uh, this uh, Zurich and Swiss environment is an uh, excellent platform to grow those kind of new innovation. Sounds like you might be moving to Zug to start your blockchain business. Yes, 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 yes. Why not? Yes. <laughs> now, you've probably had to make some tough decisions in your business life. Can you think of the biggest decision that you've had to take and how you got to the conclusion? The biggest decision I have made ever is uh, try to compete huge, gigantic governmental organization like NTT. They are protected by establishments. They are protected by governments. They are protected by uh, conservatives. We are challenger, newcomer, minor, small. So the most important issue is uh, you have uh, guts, risk-taking, as well as perseverance. You, unless you have a, a strong perseverance, nothing could be achieved. And uh, another big issue is the formation of a great management team. Without team, single man cannot achieve anything. So good management team formation is another critical issue. Has much changed today? Do we still have to be as bold and as challenging as ever before? Yes, uh, compared to 80s and 90s in Japan, today uh, kids are taking more risk. Uh, even at uh, college days on campus, they start up their ventures, and, uh, which is good things. Uh, back in 80s and 90s, all the kids want to join the big companies like IBM, AT&T, NTTs, but today, Smartest kids want to start their own company, 
ventures. That is a great, great change, and it's going to change the world. Being a true businessman never ends. You have to keep current with the times, always make decisions, sell, move on, buy again, start it from scratch, build it up. You actually sold one of your companies, e-access, to SoftBank. Why did you do that? Because uh, we started uh, e-access and uh, e-mobile, now y-mobile, uh, when I was uh, about 60s again from scratch and everybody thought that I'm crazy to start a new company at the age of 60 but I thought the uh, internet is going to become uh, a great big wave also smartphone will become a big wave that's why I started those companies at the age of uh, near 60 and uh, the company went uh, uh, very nice and after IPO, I thought, uh, what is the better uh, condition for our employees to work for? One day I had a phone call from Masa Song, and he was very eager, very passionate to merge our companies. And he and I were very strong competitors each other. But uh, I respect uh, his kind of entrepreneurship. So we sat down, we spent uh, 24 hours for a week, and we concluded that uh, we better sell our company and to let him control the future of the company. That was a better decision. Now SoftBank is a leading market leader in telecom in Japan, based upon the company I founded. Well, coming up in part two of our newsmaker tonight, from making Japan greener to dipping into trends, including artificial intelligence and cryptocurrency, telecoms legend Satyo Simoto tells us that despite his impressive list of accomplishments, he's not even close to being done yet. Let's talk tech. Do you want to see the latest gadgets? Understand where robotics will take us next? Find out more about the pioneers and their latest research? Join us on Tech Talk, where we'll be meeting the people behind the big ideas here in Switzerland and around the world and finding out what it means for businesses, consumers, and the planet. Tech Talk with Anna Maria Montero on CNN Money Switzerland. you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation. Business opportunities anywhere. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. No, it's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first check or cashing big checks. To those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Quest Means Business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. Only from CNN Money Switzerland.
The Swiss Pulse delivers you the most important global and Swiss business and financial news, connecting Switzerland to the world. Tune in every weekday from 6 p.m. or find us on the go on our website or social media. Welcome back to the Newsmaker. SoftBank, the Japanese tech to financial conglomerate, recently announced that it was seeking to join Swiss Re's board. In part two of our interview with telecoms legend Sachio Simoto, he begins by telling us how SoftBank and Swiss Re could potentially change the insurance industry. And speaking of SoftBank, it's been in the news globally, also in Switzerland. It wanted to buy a third of its company's worth mm -hmm. in shares in Swiss Re. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything more about that and what happened? I, I have been affiliated with Swiss Re back in year 2000. So I have a sort of deep affection toward the Swiss Re. So I was really surprised that Massa song wanted to have a relationship with Swiss Re. Basically, I think uh, that move is an excellent move for SoftBank. SoftBank is trying to expand not only telecom or, or uh, software, AI, IoT, but also they want to have some kind of insurance business, which compensate the total spectrum of SoftBank business. Swiss Re is an excellent uh, potential opportunity for SoftBank. Which comes back to your earlier point of strategy to be very diverse and to have your fingers in many different pies when it comes to business, not just focus on one. Mm -hmm. Talking of mergers earlier, we know that AT&T would like to uh, buy Turner mm -hmm. in the US. What do you think of mega mergers? Uh, that's uh, pros and cons. Uh, I basically support the competition. So the more competition is better for the society. But sometimes AT&T, big corporation, they have some internal issues always, bureaucracies, you know, something like that. They need some fresh air, new blood to grow further. And it is natural, big corporation like AT&T wants to have a new blood inside. So I do appreciate to some extent AT&T wants to have that kind of uh, merger. Talking about uh, the growth areas of the future, seems like you have a, a crystal ball over your life when you've been able to predict things that will happen in the future. You mentioned cryptocurrency and artificial intelligence. Where would you put your money on the growth industry of the future? At this moment, uh, I'm uh, growing uh, several AO IoT ventures, both in Silicon Valley and uh, in Japan. They are more realistic uh, kind of area of uh, next wave. CRISPR, cryptocurrency is the next, next wave, which is not standardized yet, which is not fairly regulated yet. So for the timing, I put more focus on AI, IoT, security, those areas, uh, including uh, EV, uh, those kind of green energy, so, but uh, in a further distance, uh, the cryptocurrency is going to become the next, next wave. I'm very confident. In terms of uh, renewable energy, you are part of Renova Inc., um, a renewables firm. Tell me about your idea for a greener future. Uh, that is a very nice question. Uh, Japan has been focused in the past 20 years just nuclear plants. And nuclear plants, nuclear plants, nuclear plants. But uh, as you might know, 2011, we had the huge tragedy of Fukushima power, power nuclear plant uh, tragedy. And uh, people, especially female, they uh, become very sensitive against uh, nuclear plants. 
And now the general public are supporting more and more, especially from the last year. Japanese public is trying to support more green energy. In that sense, Japan was totally behind uh, the developed countries, including Europe, uh, green energy arena. So today's uh, green energy percentage in Japan is only 5%, compared to more than 50% in Germany or Denmark, 10-20% uh, in uh, Europe and America, even India and China, more than 10%. So Japan was totally behind green energy area, which means there are lots of room for Japan to grow in the green energy. So I try to make this happen just like I did a telecom in KDDI, starting from scratch to 60 billion euro company uh, in 10 years. I try to create a new green energy power company in Japan, uh, learning from a lot from uh, uh, Dong Energy, uh, based in Denmark, which is about twice the size of the largest uh, conventional UTT company in Japan. And what's the 10-year outlook? What do you hope to achieve? Well. The, I try to make this uh, Renova become uh, the leader in Japan, as well as the leader in Asia, and hopefully we'll make this company as a $10 billion company, green energy focus. And take it from 5% to 50%? Oh, 50% might be a little bit difficult, maybe 30%, yes. Realistic targets. You mentioned a female are particularly against nuclear. Why is that? Because Japanese females are always the victims of uh, Hiroshima atomic bombs. And Japanese females are very sensitive about uh, nuclear energy. And uh, of course, uh, they are more protective uh, for kids and uh, grandkids uh, compared to men. Man tried to support nuclear energy because of uh, uh, engineering. I used to be a, a nuclear engineer. So basically, I was a strong supporter of nuclear plants. But I totally converted my belief uh, when I faced uh, Fukushima plants back in 2011. So now I'm a very strong supporter of uh, renewable energy because Japan needs green energy and Japan cannot support the uh, degrading uh, nuclear plants which cannot be resolved by engineering force. Green energy is the only source that can rescue Japanese energy situation. No fossil or, or gas can solve CO2 issues. Is there anything we can do on an individual level in your mind? Well, they should uh, individually, they should try to choose uh, green energy, even a little bit higher cost. Uh, they better use green energy than fossil energy or nuclear plant energy. The pity in Japan is they don't have, a, uh, consumers do not have a choice compared to Germany or Denmark. They can have a choice to choose green energy outlet or conventional energy outlet. But today, green energy price is coming down so drastically. Uh, in the uh, Denmark case, uh, uh, German case, the green energy price is lower than fossil, lower than nuclear. So I'm extremely confident Japan will catch up Europe pretty soon. S sounds like another sector you're going to make very competitive. Yes. Competitive is your theme. Yes, <laughs> which brings the real benefits, goodness to the society. Without competition, you know, the always dominant becomes a conservative bureaucracy, which brings uh, lots of disadvantage to consumers. What I'm trying to aim is to bring the good things, good wills to the society. If you aim that kind of attitude, 
your business will definitely win. So not greed, but good for all. Stay healthy with competition. What would you say to the younger generation coming into the workforce? Uh, Where they, should they aim their efforts? Okay, they, generally speaking, uh, youngsters, they are somewhat uh, because of uh, prosperity in the modern world. Uh, big countries like uh, Japan, US, and some of the European countries, they tend to become a little bit conservative to enjoy comfortable life. But uh, I was in Singapore last year, I was in Malaysia last year, and I found those young engineers, young entrepreneurs, they take more risk uh, rather than enjoy comfortable life. So I, my instruction and my advice to younger generation is take risk, well prepare, stand up and act. And what incentivizes the younger people, do you believe? Is it money? Is it flexible hours? What motivates them? Money is not the best solution. The best, best thing is you to work for the goodness of the society. You better serve the goodness of the society. You should serve for the people. As long as you pursue that kind of attitude, money follows. Don't pursue the money. Most of the company that pursue money, they fail 99%. Any regrets, Mr. Samoto? Regret? I wish I could be young again. <laughs> then I can try and make another huge, gigantic move. I'm a little bit slightly old today, 75 years old. But I'm still energetic. I try to change the green world in Japan and Asia. Sounds like you've got lots of energy to me. And if you were 20 again, what would be your big thing that you would tackle? Maybe cryptocurrency. <laughs> One last question. You're in Switzerland, in Zurich. Uh, what are your feelings for Switzerland generally? Any food you like, any places you like to go to? Zurich, uh, financial centre. This is the, one of the best financial centers in the world. I like to the CEOs of the financial centers, uh, institutions, organizations. I like to exchange the views of those top CEOs, top executives, sit down and uh, digest their opinion, listen and criticize each other. This is the best place and you have an excellent university like ETH. And post-tax secrecy, the reputational-wise, the financial institutions here, nothing has changed for you? Not much, not much. It doesn't affect too much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. <laughs> All right, well, stay with us here on the Newsmaker Hour. In a week that saw Facebook plunge in value, we're looking at how the tech industry could develop in the future. And stock markets fluctuate as trade war is still a big concern among investors. All the analysis coming up next. Business is always changing. Keep up with CNN Money. Maggie Lake is live in the heart of the world's economic epicenter, New York City, tracking all the action of the stock exchanges and the big business stories from around the world. Get top analysis of market movements and a daily breakdown of financial headlines. CNN Money with Maggie Lake. Spotlight CNN Money Switzerland's program dedicated to lifestyle, celebrity, entertainment and culture. We bring you a snapshot of the latest trends in Switzerland and around the world. From Hollywood to design, big names and rising stars, to art collectors and architects. It's right here under the Spotlight. Spotlight with Martina Fuchs on CNN Money Switzerland. 
CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV or on the go through our website, cnnmoney.ch, or through your favorite social media. The best Swiss business news, whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. How do you make sure you're feeling good? We'll be focusing on all the tools available to us today to make sure we're physically and mentally healthy. From monitoring and avoiding disease to reactive and preventative health care. In particular, we'll be delving into the latest innovation coming out of Switzerland to ensure a long and healthy life. Feeling good with Amanda Kane on CNN Money Switzerland. Since the founding of the Red Cross in 1863, the city of Geneva has a long tradition of hosting international organizations. In our program, International Geneva, we'll be exploring issues of international cooperation, humanitarian assistance and human rights, and talk to international players about the challenges and solutions to global problems. International Geneva with Martina Fuchs on CNN Money Switzerland. The Newsmaker is the ultimate talk show, where the biggest names in Switzerland tell you their most important stories. We delve into the economy, markets, politics, real estate, media, technology, and more to sharpen your mind and broaden your horizon. Every weekday from 8 to 9 p.m. We're back. The Facebook data scandal is certainly spooking tech investors. Earlier, I spoke to Tom Hannan. He is the founder of Web Republic, one of the leading digital marketing uh, companies here in Switzerland. They conceptualize, implement, and optimize advertising campaigns on search engines, display networks, social media, and YouTube. I began by asking him if he was surprised by what happened with Facebook. I was surprised by the scope of it, clearly. I was surprised that, uh, that actually on, on the large scale that it happened. And you deal in data, similar data, don't you? I mean, how widespread is this kind of practice to buy and sell data? I think, first of all, you need to differentiate between owning data or working with the data that is actually available. Right? So uh, as a digital marketeer, of course, you're using platforms like Facebook. You use platforms like Google or other networks. Um, but if you launch a campaign there, you use basically their infrastructure in many ways. But it's a whole different story if you start to scrape data, aggregate the data in such a way, and then um, use it uh, maybe on a third-party device. Or and platforms. so that, that part would be illegal, but actually looking at data is not. Um, you know, illegal, and I think this is going to be quite interesting to see what is going to happen out of this, uh, because obviously Facebook has asked um, Cambridge Analytica several times to remove the data that they have scraped quite some time ago, which they have not. Um, so this is going to be interesting to see how that will develop. But I think one of the big challenges uh, that we will see, or uh, interesting evolutions that we will see is basically how will we deal with uh, the sheer amount of data that we can aggregate also from a legal point of view? Do you think it's just too much of a gray area then when it comes to this buying and selling and scraping of data? Absolutely. I mean, this is still a, quite a gray area and we also have to be uh, aware that this is a quite a new discipline that we are in. And uh, we see now that with also the new data protection law, the GDPR, certain initiatives are being taken to kind of like structure and, and identify what can be done, how much, and this is very important, uh, needs to be also uh, opt-in or informed to, by the user. And is this how the user can in, inform themselves and involve themselves in the protection of their own data? So... 
basically educating uh, the education of the user, in my point of view, is something that is extremely important in that context. So how do we protect ourselves? First of all, we cannot be, uh, we cannot be believe in any app and just click on anything. So we need to have a certain common sense. Also, if I download a free app, for instance, uh, I have to ask myself, um, why is this app free? So what am I giving in return? And most of the time, it's some data point of some kind. But also, if I walk around with my handy, many data points are sent there. So generally, I think it's going to be a very interesting um, evolution to see in the com coming 12 to 24 a month on how the user is actually being educated to um, deal with different devices and become smarter in the way uh, or better say more aware on how his data is being shared and used. And this, I guess, this whole scandal could be the starting point of some regulation process. I mean, the regulation process already has started with uh, the GDPR, uh, the data protection mm -hmm. law that's, uh, that is happening. And I think it's, very, it's something very good and, uh, that is happening because what we have seen and what I have witnessed over the course of my career, uh, also prior to the Web Republic, it was that the technical evolution and the possibilities, they grow faster than the ability for humans to really understand what the technology actually can do, but also from a legal point of view have uh, laws and legislations that uh, identify certain parameters, what is to do. Uh, and some of the other companies that are out there, you, you used to work for Google yourself, I mean, are they aware of this? Are they aware of... Of the fact that, they, they, well, the, ch the changes in regulation and the fact that Absolutely. people aren't as switched on Absolutely. as or they're, they're following the technology and they're far behind in following the technology? I think it's a... If you look at companies like a Google or a Facebook or many other large platforms, um, they are very aware what they can do mm -hmm. and they have to work very closely with uh, the regulatory uh, institutions to also understand where do they need to be careful and what data they can share. And, they, and this regulation, though, is going to get tighter. Absolutely. And this is happening right now, actually, in Europe, uh, especially with the GDPR. And that is a very good evolution. But I'm wondering if, if the actual Facebook incident itself is going to uh, propel the, the regulation to I'm be sure. tighter and more quick and come more quickly. Yes, I'm sure that this will actually propel, as you uh, said correctly, that evolution or at least propel the discussion mm -hmm. around uh, data protection or, you know, the, the general question, what is happening with my data out in the web? Web Republic, for example, how are you using people's data? So, as I mentioned, we basically look at the data aggregated by the platforms where we run the campaigns from. Uh, and uh, generally, the one of still one of the very important data points there is is looking at the IP address. Did you interact with a banner or did you not? Right. So if you interacted with a banner, you can see, oh, you bought, for instance, a, a shoe or you filled out a contact form. Mm -hmm. And depending on your uh, the action that you did there, we can understand uh, where, you, uh, where you targeted well and was it relevant. And I think this is a very important point. Um, we can use data and targeting to make the communication to you more relevant. And this is, a, this is our mission. So people shouldn't necessarily be frightened by what's happened no. with Facebook and the fact that data is being sold about them. No. But it can be a positive thing. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, we, first of all, we need to be aware this is a very young discipline that we're in. And uh, if I receive more relevant information, it's an added value for me. Yet, I also should be involved in the discussion what, uh, what is happening actually with my data. And I think this is happening right now. And how do you see the data ad business going in the future? So first of all, I think uh, there still needs to be a stronger understanding of large corporation. Uh, first of all, what data do they aggregate? How does the data infrastructure look? Uh, where do or where might they have a data leak? The question is not if there will be another data leak somewhere. The question is when, right? So uh, do the larger corporations actually have a, 
and I'm really referring here to the sea level and to the board level, that in my point of view still need to have a better understanding of, first of all, the web in general, but in that context also the technical infrastructure in right. which it's holding. Tom Hannan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Now, as the global sell-off continues, it's time to take a look at what's really going on. Monetary policy is tightening, a trade war is looming, and debt, particularly in the United States, is an issue. At the end of the day, though, it's all about how to get out of emergency mode. Earlier, I spoke to Matt Egan, Vice President of Loomis Sales and Company, about how they are managing current economic trends. The, the nice thing for the Fed is the looking at the U.S. economy is it's generally uh, normalized enough to allow them to normalize policy. So it means what we call in the business the term structure. Uh, it means yields are going to lift, and they already have, but we see more of this happening. And I, I think, you know, we can look out over the next couple of years and see, for example, the benchmark 10-year rate, U.S. rate, at maybe 3.5%, 4%. So this is, good, this is good news then for, for pensions, for savers? It's very good news, right? So they, um, all along, pension, I have a lot of pension clients, and they've been moaned the fact that they can't re reach their return hurdles in the fixed income markets, and it's forced them to take more and more risk, generally by pushing out the curve, going down in quality, or accepting a degree of illiquidity in their portfolios. So this gets, it makes it a little bit easier. The challenge is, is getting to that higher level of yield while preserving your principal. So yes, high yields are a good news for us as investors longer term, but the challenge is we don't want to lose principal from rates, the rate, uh, the upward trend in rates right now. So where do you see markets going from, from this point? So if we take the, you know, the Fed and the Treasury is going to clear the market, um, I think that there's a couple of factors that are going to boost rates uh, near term. One of them is the Fed policy. We just heard from the Fed. And the market is kind of caught up to the notion that the Fed is going to continue to raise rates at a gradual pace. Uh, my guess is that um, the economy and inflation will be strong enough for the Fed to raise the short rate, which is what they control, to a level of say three and a half percent. That that would mean inflation running, you know, maybe two and a half percent in real rates, running at maybe fifty basis points. So not you know earth shattering, but you know it's a fair amount higher than where we are today at one and three quarters percent. That would push the long end, uh, in our estimation, closer to the three and a half percent range, maybe as high as four percent for the ten year part of the curve. Uh, and why is there such a difference between? the duration in bonds? Well, the, the longer um, a bond's maturity, the, the, lo the higher its duration, and we, we, we talk about that in years, the higher the duration, the more sensitive it is to changes in interest rates. So as rates in the long end go higher, a 30-year Treasury bond can fall in price by a lot. So you can have a capital loss. And that's what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. It's great yields are going higher. That's the good news. The bad news is they're going higher, right? So. <laughs> We need to be able to, um, one, one clear strategy is for a bond investor, a manager, and what we've done in our portfolios is take in our duration a lot. So we're running with uh, what is a relatively short duration for us. Shorter duration bonds have less sensitivity to that rate move. And, okay. so, and so that's how we're defending against that. And then, I suppose, in, in a third hand, you also have politics playing right. into this as well. How does that affect your strategies? Well, we uh, were as much, uh, we have to analyze as political scientists as we are investment managers more so than ever. Um, you know, recently it's just affected when we think about the, uh, the fiscal spending that is taking place in the United States. So the tax bill, um, you know, it's, it's strange to have fiscal thrust at a time where the economy is at full employment. It's very strange. And that'll have two effects. One is that pushes up rates. Um, and, and, and can be inflationary. Uh, secondly, though, is it adds, and something that I think is less well understood, is it adds to the amount of supply of Treasury debt that needs to clear the market. And this go hand in hand, goes hand in hand with the Fed's quantitative tightening. So relative to what has had to clear the markets over the past two or three years, we're going to see an explosion in debt that has to clear the private sector and not 
you know, have the luxury of having a central banker there to buy it. And how does that happen? So we have auctions in the United States. Uh, every, every week almost there's an auction for, it could be T-bills out to the 30-year note. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the Treasury will set the auction date and they, they have an auction and it clears the market. Treasuries clear the market. They set the rate for almost every other obligation around the planet. And um, it's a supply and demand thing. And what we're starting to see already this year, we've, we've witnessed some indigestion in the auctions, meaning that the, the cover you know, of what's bid for and what's offered is not so good as it used to be. And that's just a reflection of supply coming to the market. And the most, most of the supply is on the shorter end of the curve, T-bills. And that's what's causing the short end of the curve irrespective of what the Fed funds rate is doing, like T-bills, mm -hmm. LIBOR. People probably have noticed that LIBOR is now above, you know, it's two and a quarter, uh, which is, you know, a and lot so higher. And you really kind of seeing this Fed versus the politics right yes. now. It's really yeah. kind of coming into play. For sure. And uh, the Fed is always asked, you know, how do you take into consideration this fiscal policy? And they have to take it into consideration. And they're, um, you know, they have to lean against that to a certain degree. And then we talk about trade policy, which is a whole other uh, can of worms. So in this whole Fed versus the politics, who, who do you think wins in the end? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, look, you know, the, Fed, the Fed's mandate is uh, stable um, prices, full employment. Simple as that. And they're going to be bound to that, um, their, whatever their role is in, in playing that. And so to the extent fiscal policy affects that, and maybe makes the economy run on the hotter side, they're gonna lean against that and have to raise rates higher than they otherwise would. And you know, up until recently, we felt like you know, this year, a lot of um, the market was pricing in just about three rate hikes. And I was kind of leaning towards maybe four because inflation is actually showing signs of actually picking up and so on. The economy's pretty hot in the US. Um, now though, you look at, what's kind of taking place on the other side of the political spectrum in the trade fight, and that's not good for economic growth. OK, well, we'll have to wait and see yeah. how it all plays out. Matt Egan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Well, all our interviews are available on our website. Just head to www.cnnmoney.ch. That's it from us, from the Swiss Pulse this week. We'll be back on Monday from 6. Join us then if you can. Bye-bye. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland Weekend Weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. Comfort indexes for some cities. Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. Discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. News programs are usually full of short stories that hardly go beneath the surface. We give you the big picture. Every weekday evening at 7 p.m., the big picture goes deeper, looking at an issue from different angles and bringing you the guests who take time to speak, explain, and elaborate. Our viewers get a deeper understanding of the day's issues and the context that underlies them. The big picture, weekdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Money is more than just currency. 
It is the fuel for how we live our lives. It connects us. It drives us. It buys us things. But it is more than that. It is who we are and what we want. <laughs> Money isn't everything, but it is everywhere. And so are we. We are younger, we are richer, and we are smarter. We are money. CNN Money. The Newsmaker is the ultimate talk show, where the biggest names in Switzerland tell you their most important stories. We delve into the economy, markets, politics, real estate, media, technology, and more to sharpen your mind and broaden your horizon. Every weekday from 8 to 9 p.m. How do you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation, business opportunities anywhere. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need, whenever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV or on the go through our website, cnnmoney.ch, or through your favorite social media. The best Swiss business news, whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. trading day here on Wall Street. Kind of a cool story. It's being rung at the bell today by Blake Pyron, the first business owner in the state of Texas with Down syndrome. It is World Down Syndrome Day. You can see that we are seeing very weak open for stocks today after a volatile session on Wednesday.